Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you see my screen, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So before we uh, we continue with the next lecture on uh, multi-state capture recapture models, uh, I had a few slides I wanted to uh, to go through um, on survival estimation, <clears throat> and specifically. Um, I wanted to uh, spend uh, a minute or two on uh, the assumption, assumptions on which uh, the capture the core match and CBA models uh, rely on, and specifically uh, design uh, assumptions about design. Um, animals shouldn't uh, lose the marks, otherwise you are in trouble. The identity of individuals should be recorded without error, uh, meaning no false positives, otherwise. Uh, yeah. Well, you you create new individuals, uh, believing that uh, the, I mean, if you if you uh, if you confuse uh, an individual for another one, you create another one. And captured individuals should be a random sample of the population as well. So it's it's really a basic assumptions like in any uh, uh, in any uh, sampling in statistics in general. And more specifically for the common Julissima model. Uh, survival and recapture probability should be homogeneous. So there are ways to test for that. Uh, and uh, you also can use a uh, covariance to uh, relax this assumption like we saw yesterday. And individuals should be independent. Otherwise you get into trouble with other dispersion uh, like what you you get in uh, standard uh, generalized linear models. And here again, we have some ways to account for that. So. I won't go into the details, but my uh, my point is that uh, uh, you may use goodness of the test uh, to uh, assess this uh, the validity of these assumptions. And there is this nice paper by Roger Pradel and uh, and and colleagues in in 2005. And we also have a, an R package called R 2 You Care um, that allows you to uh, to test for these assumptions. And there are a few uh, in the paper. You have a few directions. Um, toward which you can go in case those assumptions are not um, are not fulfilled. Okay, and uh, the last thing I wanted to um, to tell you is um, uh, well, I wanted to actually spend uh, a minute on uh, what um, survival survival does uh, mean actually in capture and recapture. We briefly uh, mentioned that yesterday. But uh, okay, survival refers to the study area. That's uh, obvious, huh? the, the, your study area. Um, and the thing is that I mentioned that yesterday, and there was a nice uh, meme on Twitter from some uh, from one of you who uh, tweeted about that. Uh, mortality and permanent immigration are confounded, and it's only if you can assume that there is no permanent immigration that you actually estimate true mortality. Uh, but in general, what we estimate is apparent survival, not true survival. So what do we mean by apparent survival? Apparent survival is the product of true survival times the fidelity to the study area. Okay, So that's why it's important to uh, also keep in mind that survival refers to the study area. Because otherwise, um, uh, well, so apparent survival is the product of true survival times uh, fidelity. And fid is fidelity is well, uh, or if... Uh, Permanent immigration is zero, the probability is zero, then apparent survival is true survival. But in general, it's in between. So in general, apparent survival is less than the true survival, unless uh, fidelity to the study area is uh, the probability of uh, being uh, faithful to the study area is one. So the thing is that uh, we should use caution when interpreting a survival. It's, it's not exactly true survival. There are ways to... Uh, circumvent the issue uh, by combining with a ring recovery data where you have the actual date of death. And by combining with this kind of data, you, you may get closer to true survival. Or you may also go for, spa uh, for spatial capture recapture model to get a closer uh, estimate of true survival. OK, so we have some references uh, if you want about that, and uh, uh, which uh, we will be happy to share. Okay, so today, what uh, the, the core uh, of the demographic parameter section will be about estimating transition between sites and or states. So transition estimation. 
So it's a generalization uh, of what we saw yesterday, uh, estimating survival, which was uh, on one side. Here we will uh, deal with at least two sides or states, let's say site, site A and site B. So you have transition between those two sides, uh, okay, in one direction or the other, or you may also stay in within this site or uh, in this site. And you will have survival probabilities for both sides, okay, either site-specific survival probabilities or uh, the same survival probabilities, and you can test these kind of assumptions. Then you will also have uh, transition probabilities uh, between those two sides. So let's do what we did uh, yesterday and try to uh, figure out uh, the fate of an individual uh, that is, for example, first captured and marked and, and then released in site A. So it can survive with probability, uh, uh, survival probability for site A and either remain on site A. So that's the transition probability style from A to A. So you remain in site A, and so you alive and present in site A, okay, at the next uh, um, occasion, or uh, once you've survived, you may move to site B, okay? So there is a combination of two, two uh, things happening, two events happening here. You survive, and conditional on surviving, on survival, sorry, you move to site B, okay? And you alive and present in site B. Or, third option, uh, you die over the time interval with probability one minus the survival probability on site A. Okay, so these are the three options you have if you first captured and marked and released in site A. Same and oops, I thought uh, I was uh, about to say something about site B, but then you continue from uh, what happened at the last. Um, well, if you're alive and present in site A, you may get detected or undetected. Okay. Uh, with probability, the detection probability in site A. And if you're alive and present in site B, you may get detected or undetected with probability, probability uh, of detection in site B or uh, probability of being undetected in site B, okay, one minus PB, right? So in that case, survival and detection probabilities are site specific. You, you might want to uh, I don't know, uh, assume that uh, survival is uh, the same for both sides. So phi A is phi B or P A is P B. That's the kind of assumptions you can uh, test with multi-state and multi-site models, capture recapture models. And of course, if you're dead or you emigrated from site A, uh, you're done. So uh, what you get in terms of uh, capture histories, you get detection in site A, at first time occasion, uh, because you were released, marked and released in that site A, and recaptured in site A at the second uh, time occasion, sampling occasion. Or A and zero, zero for undetecting. Or A and B, so you survived uh, and you moved to site B. Or A and zero if you were undetected at second occasion, okay? So you see that uh, the A zero uh, encounter history a zero and zero may be uh, may be generated by three different um, um, I just say one well, um, fates or or histories. Uh, either you were alive and you stayed in site A and you went undetected, or you were alive and then you moved to site B and you went undetected, or you died uh, or emigrated from site A. And so the three options lead to the same encounter history, A0, 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 okay? So you need to really write down the three options, three mutually, and th those events are mutually exclusive. So we will do like we did uh, uh, yesterday and write down the probability of this encounter history, A0. So you were first captured and marked and released in site A and then undetected in the second sampling occasion using the three events, the probability of the three events. And it's only two sampling occasions. So you see that with two sites and two sampling occasions, the possibility is to generate um, one single uh, encounter history uh, are uh, three in that time, in that uh, instance. So you can imagine that if you increase the number of sites or the number of occasions, the possibilities to generate uh, a given capture histories uh, in increase. 
and uh, it's it's becoming very difficult to write down uh, explicitly the probability of any given uh, capture history. Fortunately, you won't have to do that, and uh, there are programs uh, that uh, do the job for you. Of course, you have the same thing uh, if you are first captured and marked and released inside B, uh, and you get those uh, nice capture histories with BB uh, and so on. Okay, and then, like we did yesterday for the core major Cibar model, you can write down the probability of each capture history and then form the likelihood and maximize this likelihood to get the maximum likelihood estimate of the survival probabilities, the transition probabilities, and the detection probabilities. If you are, if you are more into a Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian stuff, you can use the likelihood, combine it with a prior, and try to figure out the posterior distribution and the uh, and go from there. A little bit of history, like yesterday, uh, to do that. The, the first paper um, uh, came out in uh, 73, uh, 19, I should say, 1973, by, uh, um, by Neil Arneson, uh, who proposed this uh, generalization of the cormac jolie model <coughs> to uh, several sites. Okay, you see uh, more, at least two areas or strata he used to call that uh, strata, and that was the first proposal uh, of a multi-site uh, capture recapture model. Okay. The thing is that at that time, it was very difficult to uh, uh, come up with a, oh, um, an efficient way to write down the likelihood, uh, like we saw uh, in the previous slide. It gets very messy, very complex to write the likelihood. So it wasn't until um, 1993 and the development of, uh, of uh, personal computers that uh, we could actually use multi-state capture recapture models. So you see that uh, between the two papers, it was 20 years, huh? and those those models were not, were not used until the, the 90s. So it's uh, it's nice to see that actually, and it's thanks to the progress of computers that uh, we can now use these models. And uh, this paper by uh, Karl Schwartz. Was uh, who is a, a Canadian statistician? Uh, he's now retired, but uh, he contributed a lot to the the field, like uh, uh, Neil and Anderson. And so this model is called the schwartz anderson model or multi-state multi-site model. So the initial papers were all about sites. Uh, so A and B would be. Uh, uh, colonies or, I don't know, uh, breeding sites or wintering sites, you see what I mean, geographical locations, um, so discrete um, places in space, okay? So it's not continuous and it's also sites, geographical locations. But soon uh, someone realized uh, that sites could be states, uh, physiological states or epidemiological states or breeding states. and uh, uh, this was those two papers by uh, led by uh, Jim Nichols, uh, with no surprise, huh? Jim Nichols and uh, the team, John Sauer, Ken Pollock, Jay Hesbeck, Bill Link, uh, uh, Jim Hines, uh, people from Patrick Center in the US from this uh, uh, this amazing center, uh, research center. And so they said, oh, we could actually replace sites by states and estimate transition probabilities uh, to address like uh, evolutionary questions in evolutionary ecology, like uh, life history trade-offs, uh, if states are breeding states, for example, and uh, it opens uh, like many possibilities. And uh, these models uh, got used more and more uh, from 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 these two papers, uh, following these two uh, the, the publication of these two papers. Okay, examples of multi-state models. So you may you may have uh, like I said these states like sick or healthy instead of site A site B, and you estimate transition between uh, between those uh, epidemiological states. So uh, it's the probability of recovering or the probability of getting infected. So you see that uh, uh, possibilities are infinite. Uh, the states could be uninfected, infected, and recovered. And so uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, SIR models in epidemiology. So these multi-state models can help to estimate uh, the, the, uh, the parameters that we need to, uh, to calibrate those, uh, those epidemiological models and uh, study the, the transmission of, uh, of diseases. Um, so they are very useful. 
the states could be uh, morphological states like small, medium, big, or light, medium, heavy, and you could uh, you could uh, study the growth of individuals <clears throat> or breeding states. And that was probably the first application: uh, breeder, non-breeder, failed breeder, first-time breeder, breeder with one or two offsprings, and you can uh, study. Uh, uh, trade-offs between survival and breeding, for example, or between breeding in one year and breeding in the next year. So, like I said, uh, realizing that sites could be, uh, can be states actually opens up uh, many, many possibilities and uh, exciting possibilities to use capture capture models in the wild uh, with uh, data on wild animals to study uh, <coughs> questions that uh, we used to study in a controlled environment. And the states could be development, uh, developmental or life history states like juvenile subadult adult and uh, social states as well, like solitary, solitary or group living states or subordinate and dominant. And you could ask questions in behavioral ecology. So you see, again, the possibilities are infinite. And that state, uh, why uh, am I saying that? Because uh, so alive or dead from harvest or de dead from natural causes, why am I spending some time on that? Because it was it was really uh, useful to uh, to realize that that we could use uh, death states as a state and not only alive states uh, in those multi-state models. Because by doing that, you can uh, combine different types of data sets and you can infer uh, uh, probable uh, causes of death and try to disentangle uh, uh, death from natural causes, from death from harvest, or death from other causes. So these models get very, very useful to ask uh, a bunch of questions. And states, in brief, are like yesterday we saw, uh, we went through uh, time varying individual uh, covariates, and that's exactly what they are, uh, individual time-specific categorical covariates. So they are discrete covariates, like uh, small, medium, big, and uh, an individual may change across time uh, from one state to the other, or go back to a previous state, or you can post constraint. And also, uh, these states are different from one individual to the other. Okay, so it's individual and time specific, uh, discrete covariate or categorical covariate. Okay, for practicing, we're going to use um, this. Uh, it's the equivalent of the deeper data set in uh, single state models for the Cormac Julie model, the Canada Gig uh, data set. Um, uh, from a paper by Jay Hasbeck uh, that was published uh, in the 90s. And the sites were wintering sites, okay? And the authors were studying fidelity to these uh, wintering sites in Canada Geese. And so uh, we have three uh, wintering sites in the Carolinas, Chesapeake, and Mid-Atlantic. And hang on, we have 21,277 bandit geese. So it's a huge data set that was kindly provided by Jay Hasbeck. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six years from 84 to uh, 89. And uh, you see that you have a bunch of data. Uh, I'm not displaying the, the whole data set, but you see that you have zeros for undetected, two for detected in Chesapeake, I think, three for detected in mid-Atlantic for that particular individual. In rows, these are the individuals. And one for detected in um, in Carolinas. Carolinas, okay. Okay, time for a live demo. Right. <clears throat> okay. Did I forget to register to record the? Oh no. Okay, perfect. Live demo. Okay, so the data, again, the data are in, let me show you on the website, the data are here in data sets, okay? So you just click on it and, uh, and you will download the zip file with all the data in it. You just unzip the data, the, the compressed uh, file. And then inside you have a CSV file with the GIS dataset. And so you see that it's a huge dataset uh, with uh, 
lot of data, a lot of individuals bend it. Okay. So first and first, we, oops, we read in the data. Um, oh, actually I have two data sets. One, a small one and a big one. The all these data set is the data set with the, the all individuals. So the 21,000 individuals. Good. Okay. And, uh, okay. So if you read in this data set, you see that you have, okay, individuals in rows. And actually these are not, well, these are not individuals. These are, let me, let me hide that. Okay. Let me, okay. So these are, and, um, so you see that there is this last column, big N here. And for example, 158, what does that mean? You might uh, be able to figure it out. It's, it's, it's actually the number of individuals that have this particular encounter history. So we have 158 individuals that have been undetected for the first five years and detected in the Carolinas in the last year. Okay. And we have, for example, 748 individuals that were undetected on all occasions, except in 88, where they were detected in Chesapeake, I think, or Mid-Atlantic. I can't remember what the second site is. Okay. So it's a way to, comp to kind of uh, condense the, the data set. Rather than having uh, 21,000 rows, you have much less rows. Uh, actually, we have... Uh, 623 rows by just having this column that sum up, sums up all, the, all the, the same individuals, the same, the individuals with the same capture histories and record the number of uh, individuals having that particular uh, capture histories. Okay. And it's also a way to speed up the computational process. Huh? If you go in Mark and uh, you analyze this data set, it will be uh, faster than, um, uh, considering the, the data the data set with an uh, individual per row. The only issue with that is that um, when it gets to, uh, when you get to use individual covariates, then you need to use the full data set, well, the full data set, the data set with one individual per row because uh, the individual covariate might be different from uh, one individual to the other, even though they have the same uh, encounter history, okay? Okay, like yesterday, I first build a data frame with, um, uh, with what? With, uh, well, the, the number of individuals with a particular encounter history. So that's the second column in my data frame. And the first element of my data frame is this CH for caption history column, uh, which is a character column with uh, no separation. And I just take the zeros, ones, twos, and threes and put them all together in a single column. Okay. So I get this uh, data frame with two columns, CH and FREC, and uh, we, we see again uh, that uh, 158 individuals have this particular encounter history, okay? Second step, so we have our data frame for the, the, the raw data, and then we process the data uh, to tell uh, our mark that uh, we're going to use multi-strata uh, uh, models or so multi-state models, okay? Uh, by doing so, uh, we tell uh, mark and our mark that we're going to estimate uh, survival probabilities, uh, transition probabilities, and detection probabilities, okay? So we pre prepare things, we pre-process the data to be able to pass them uh, into a mark, the mark uh, function of the R mark package. And then we create the design matrix. Okay, so that's a single step. Huh? And then like yesterday, we build up our uh, effects um, on each of the parameters. So here we have uh, one more parameter, uh, one, one more set of parameters, the transition probabilities from one side to the other or from uh, or in all directions, okay? So we have three sides. So actually it's from A to B, A to C, so two, B to uh, A, B to C, and C to A, C to B, okay? So we have a, a bunch of uh, transition probabilities. Uh, 
like yesterday, okay, we, we're going to consider, just to start with, a constant survival probability. So it's an uh, intercept, like yesterday, the formula equals tilde and then 1, to say it's uh, an intercept, so a constant parameter, and we put that, we put this formula in the list. Um, we, we also want to test whether there is a, a site-specific survival, an effect of the site uh, on survival. So the keyword is stratum for site or state. So it's it's uh, using the the, the original um, uh, terminology of uh, of Neil Arneson, uh, strata, stratum, strata. The, the plural plural of stratum is strata. So we have a stratum effect or a site effect or a state or a state effect. Okay. On survival, so I, oops, sorry for that. So I call it uh, phi dot site, and that's a list with a formula with an effect of a stratum. Okay. For detection probability, I will go simple and just use a constant detection, so an intercept. And now for uh, the transition probabilities, this is a bit tricky. Um, first, we're going to remove the intercept like we would do in a, a GLM or LM and R. We remove the intercept because we want to esti we don't want to use a, a particular strata as a reference like we would do in a, in a, in a linear model uh, with a discrete covariate. But uh, we want to estimate all transition probabilities from the departure. So for, uh, you you depart from a site and you go to another site. So to another site. And so this is the kind of the interaction between the departure and arrival. Okay. So at the beginning, it's not very intuitive, but uh, well, it, it, uh, it's the way it's coded uh, from to uh, another site. Okay. And by doing that, you're considering all possible combinations from, uh, uh, from one site to the other. And here we have three sites, uh, Chesapeake, Mid-Atlantic, and Carolinas. Carolinas. Carolinas, Carolinas. And uh, we need a specific um, link function. So um, the transition probabilities are probabilities. So we're going to use some kind of logic link, like for survival yesterday and for detection probability. The only cons the only difference is that now the, the transition probabilities from site A uh, to site A and from site A to site B and from site A to site C must sum up to one, okay? So the transition probability from one side to all the other ones, including that particular site, must sum up to one, okay? You, you cannot uh, leave the system. So you either, either you stay on the site where you are or you leave to uh, one of the, the other sites. And so the sum of these transition probabilities should be one, okay? So this is a new link function, which is called, uh, so it has several names, it's called the, uh, the generalized uh, logic link, the multinomial uh, logic link, or multinomial link, or the softmax uh, link function. It has several names. Uh, what you need to keep in mind is just uh, a, a generalization of the logic link to uh, more than, uh, than one state. And it ensures that the probability, the estimates are between zero and one, and that the sum of the transition probabilities is one. Okay. And then we call uh, the mark function and we pass the, the usual parameters, the process data, the design matrix, and then the list of uh, uh, effects on the parameters. So survival now is no, is no longer fine, like in the complex receiver model. In a multi-strata, multi-site, or multi-state model, it's called in mark and our mark big S. So careful with that because it's a, uh, it's a source of error. Uh, we use phi and it's not phi, it's big S. And so we use um, our um, uh, site-specific effect on, uh, on survival. Detection, we assume that it's constant. And then we have our full uh, uh, transition matrix with uh, all the possible combinations, uh, transition between sites. Okay. So let's fit that model. Uh, okay, so we get a bunch of parameters. Uh, here we get, we get 10 parameters. So we get three survival probabilities for each of the three sites, and we get one detection probability, okay, right? And then we get, so three plus one is four, we get six transition probabilities, 
because we have three sides. So it's from one, uh, it's from two to one, three to one, one to two, two, three to two, well, all the combinations, you, you get the, the idea, okay? And like yesterday, the estimates we get, well, we get uh, estimates that are negative and lower than uh, zero, well, negative and uh, maybe bigger than one, not in that case, but uh, it could be the case. Remember, the estimates we get from Mark, and actually that's uh, uh, that's what's happening in R when you fit a JLM model, you get those estimates on the uh, link function scale, okay? Here, for survival and detection probability on logic scale, and for the transition probabilities, these are on the uh, generalized logic link scale, okay? But we can uh, trust Mark uh, to help us, and we extract the real estimate from the results yeah, and you see that we get a lot of uh, things. And uh, first thing first, we get uh, the survival estimates. And we get, you see, the, the survival is around 60% uh, or 70% in all three uh, winter insights. Detection probability is around uh, 40%. And then we get uh, transition probabilities. So it's a bit ugly because we get these uh, transition probabilities for all time sampling occasions. Uh, well, it's, you see this one is copied and pasted uh, a lot of times. It's the same thing. Yeah? So you get a, a list of outputs, which is just huge. But there is a way to um, get something a bit cleaner, is to, to use this function, which is called get real. And so we get the real estimate of the parameter psi, and we want the standard error. So VCV is for variance covariance matrix. Huh? So it's just to get the confidence intervals and standard errors. So we get the real psi estimate of uh, from the model we just did in, with a site specific effect on psi, uh, on the phi, sorry, on the survival uh, transition probabilities and the constant detection probability. We extract these estimates. Hmm, I'm using an equal here, it should be an error. And then we use this function, uh, which is a function from the RMAP package called transition matrix, which will uh, kind of uh, uh, clean up the output that we got from the, uh, a naive uh, call to uh, a real estimate. Uh, this transition matrix put everything in order in a nice format, which is here. You get this matrix here, which is the transition probability from site one to site two, from site one to site, uh, from, sorry, from site one to site one. So it's the probability of remaining in site one, leaving site one for site two, and leaving site one for site three, okay? And same thing, this is uh, the probability of uh, leaving from site two to site one, staying in site two here in the middle. So the first diagonal here, it's staying on the on the, on the the side, okay? Site one, site two, or site three. And then you get all the transition probabilities. You get a matrix of standard errors here, and you also get a matrix for the lower bound of the confidence interval uh, for each transition uh, probability and uh, the matrix for the upper bound uh, of the confidence interval for each uh, transition probability. So you see here that um, uh, once you are on the site, the probability of staying on that site is very high. Okay, It's uh, around uh, 70%. Uh, and, and the probability of leaving a site is uh, much lower than the probability of re remaining on the site. It's not... It's not insignificant, like uh, the probability of leaving site one to go to site two is 24%, uh, so it's not uh, negligible. And the probability of leaving site two to go, site three, sorry, to go to site uh, two is quite uh, is quite high too. Uh, site three seems to be uh, unattractive. You see, you don't want to sit site one, you don't want to leave site one to go to site three. The probability of leaving site one uh, to move to site three is uh, kind of zero. The probability of leaving site two to go to site three is also uh, almost zero. And actually, um, uh, the probability of staying on site three is only 66%, whereas the probability of staying on site one and site two is uh, more than uh, 75%, okay? So site three, and I think it's uh, mid-Atlantic, uh, seems uh, less attractive than uh, the two other sites as a wintering site, okay? Okay, um, Okay. we're gonna run another model without, oh, there is a typo here, without a state effect on, uh, a side effect on survival. So now we're using our phi 
list uh, formula, you remember, where survival is constant. And so we want to test the effect of, uh, is there a side effect on survival? So we run this model, uh, and then you estimate only one survival probability, one detection probability, still constant, and six uh, transition probabilities like before, okay? And it's eight parameters. And then we can compare the IIC of uh, the two models using the collect uh, the collect model. Uh, so again, you can get the transition probabilities and blah, blah. And you can use the collect models to compare the two models. And you see that the model where there is a, a side effect on survival is doing uh, much better the, uh, than the model where there is no side effect on survival in the sense that a the IIC uh, value is uh, much lower. It's a difference of uh, 15 units huh? uh, between the two models. So there seems to be a side effect on survival. On, uh, so there, uh, there are sites where uh, the geese are surviving better than, uh, than on the other ones. And that's all for this uh, live demo. Um, yeah. So a few um, a few references before uh, we go on a break. Um, this paper by Le Breton uh, uh, from '92 I discussed uh, yesterday. It's a monography and it's a very very nice paper. Uh, so I encourage you to read it. Uh, okay, it takes some time, 60 pages, but it's very very informative and uh, you'll learn a lot from it. And Jean Dominique also wrote this paper. It's kind of a uh, not the mirror paper of that one, but uh, it's it's this it's also a review of capture recapture model, but multi-state models, so the models we've just seen today. And I think uh, when I mentioned that, but there is a, a gentle introduction to the program mark, where there are, where there is a, a nice chapter on uh, on survival on the Cormac receiver model and, and a very nice chapter on multi-state models. And the big book by uh, Williams, Nichols, and Cora is. Uh, is a is a is a very good investment. It's a, a big one, but uh, I can have a look. Yeah. It's a big book with uh, can't remember the number of pages, but uh, it's very exhaustive and uh, uh, well, it's very expensive, but it's a good investment. And I was mentioning this paper on the goodness of it test. Uh, it's freely available. You can uh, have a look to it. Okay. Uh, I think that's all for me, so I'm a bit uh, ahead of schedule, so we're going to go for a break. Um, so it's going to be a 20 minutes break, and we'll resume at 10 with uh, Sarah, who will, uh, who, will, uh, who will introduce you with the matrix model, population projection models, and so on, okay? So we'll see you in 20 minutes at, uh, what, 10 a.m. for... Uh, Okay, see you in 20 minutes. Okay, so we are back. I don't know if you can hear me. Um... Wait a second. Can you hear me? Can you? I'm not sure. Oui, on t'entend. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. So we're going to start this last uh, class of the workshop. And we're going to have three sessions together about population projection models. So we've seen so far how to assess current past and past trends in population abundance with Aurelien. Then uh, with Olivier, you discussed how to estimate demographic parameters and identify the causes of variation within survival rates or trans transition rates in capture recapture models. And now we're gonna see the kind of things we can do using abundance estimates or census data or demographic parameters to assess population viability and inform management decisions. 
I mean, the objective is is to use it um, this way. So imagine the temporal dynamics of a virtual population here. We have census data or uh, yeah, population size. Imagine we know it perfectly for now from years 2000 to 2022. The type of questions we are very interested in asking in conservation is what are the chances that this population is going to decline in, in future, for example? So here are the blue dots uh, with the dashed line. This kind of trajectory would be very concerning if this was a population uh, declining very strongly. So based on the data that we have, how can we assess the chances of this type of uh, declining trajectory that could happen in the future. So that's the objective of population viability analysis. So a formal definition would be um, to evaluate based on the data we have at hand and modeling technique, what's the likelihood that the population will persist or will go extinct if it doesn't persist for some time that we chose based on uh, political or legal or biological um, uh, time reasons, so a certain number of, of years into the future. So uh, we'll see that this number of years uh, has consequences for the, the robustness of our analysis because it's very hard to predict uh, the population trajectory the long if we go very far into the future. So it's better to use not to long projection depth. So we're going to be using quantitative methods to predict the future status of a population. And uh, it's very important to stress that uh, we're not trying to actually predict the future, but taking into account all the uncertainty around the potential trajectories of the population. And, um, and so it's tentative assessments based on what we know. Uh, rather than ironclad predictions of population fate. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. And these are the two main references on which these classes are based. So the famous book by Hulk as well on matrix population models. And also uh, another reference that is uh, very useful is uh, Morris et al. in 1999, 1999, a practic practical handbook for population viability analysis. There are a lot of other resources. I'll give a short list at the end of the class, but these two are, are, are very important ones, I'd say. So let's start with the important things to keep in mind all along this, uh, this uh, practical and in general when you're trying to run population viability analysis. Whatever technique you use, you should remember that uh, your results and the robustness uh, of your results will mainly depend on the amount of data you have at hand. So the, this plot on the left is uh, showing the, the population size data I just presented you before. We have a 22 years old years time series with population size. If we're trying to run a PVA on this using this data, it's going to be much less informati informative that then if we use the, the data on the, on the right plot in which we have a much longer time series. And you can see just visually that the, the trend in population size is already uh, more clear. Just looking at the data that you see that in the 60s, the population was higher and then it started to decline. So if you use these two different database data sets, the results of the, your analysis will be different. Um, um, we all we should always keep that in mind that whatever technique we use, a very important part of our of our analysis is which data we are um, using to make the predictions. The longer is the time series, obviously, the better it is. Same for the temporal variance that we have in the data. 
on the plot on the left, you see a lot of uh, interannual variation in population size. And on the plot on the right, it's a smooth curve. It's like an ideal perfect population. Imagine if you had a very linear, I mean, it, here is non-linear, but um, very low interannual variance in the data. It would be much easier to make predictions on what's going to happen in the next years. And it's much harder to have uh, precise estimates if you have a lot of uh, temporal variance in the data. It's the same if we consider uh, the precision of the data you're using. On the plot on the left here, Im imagine it could represent population size that we know with certainty. Imagine a species that would be really easy to monitor, where you have uh, no uncertainty of the about the number of individuals in the population every year, compared to plot on the right, in which you have uh, some uncertainty, even if it's not uh, very huge in this case. Um, the more uncertainty there is on the census data, and uh, the the harder it's going to be to make predictions about what's going to happen in the next years. So we should always keep that in mind, that the data we're using are very important and drive a lot of the uncertainty on the, about, on the results of our analysis. So first, uh, in this uh, first uh, 15, 50 minutes, we're going to see how we can try to assess population viability using census data. So that kind of relate with the first class by Aurelien where you store how to collect and how to analyze population counts. First, we're going to start simple and consider a deterministic model, which means we do not include random variation in the model. We assume that uh, the trajectory of the population is known with certainty. And we consider an exponential growth model, which means that um, Imagine we have this type of trajectory for the population, that's population size on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And we make the assumption here that every year the population is growing at a constant rate of growth, okay? Constant rate of change. So we can write that lambda, which is equal to nt plus one divided by, by nt, it captures the proportional change in population size from one year to the next. So population size at time two is equal lambda times population size at time one, et cetera. Lambda is constant. So in this case, lambda is the population growth rate, which is unique because we just said that it doesn't change with time. So for this simple case, uh, we know that uh, if lambda is uh, bigger than one, it means that the population is exponentially growing. If lambda equals one, then the population is stable. That's the blue trajectory. And if lambda is less than one, it means that the population is declining. So because lambda is a ratio of population size, time t plus one divided by time t, it is uh, distributed from a log normal distribution because uh, population size can only be a positive number. So it's a Poisson distribution. The ratio of the two means that lambda uh, follows a log normal distribution with a certain mean that we call mu, and a certain variance, uh, sigma in general. <clears throat> when we are running simulations and in the quantitative uh, methods in general, we don't like so much to work with a log normal distribution because as soon as you have zeros in the, in the code, you're going to get some errors. So we much prefer to work with a normal distribution. So instead of lambda, we generally use the R, which is the rate of increase, and it's just the log of lambda. So R is the log of nt plus one divided by mt that we can also write 
log the nt plus one minus log the nt. So it's still capturing the rate of increase of the population, but on a log scale, which means that r, the rate of increase, is normally distributed and that makes things easier for us um, when we're computing the population. So mean value of R is uh, noted mu and sigma is called the environmental variance. So because we're now on a normal scale, if R is positive, it means the population is growing, which is the equivalent of lambda being bigger than one. So if we calculate this quantity in our census data by dividing the ratio of uh, population size at t plus one by population size at time t, we can uh, calculate the value of r and use this uh, rate of increase to project the population from one year to the next. And this is relatively easy in this case because we just say, said that r, uh, we assume that it's a constant in time. So if we know the initial population size, n1, we can just simply calculate population size or here log of population size at time t using this equation. So log population size at time t equals log population size uh, at time one, initial population size, plus rate of increase times t. So it's just um, the same thing that we have with lambda, but on a log scale. So we just multiply initial, we add to, we sub, we multiply rate of increase by the number of years over which we want to project the population. And we add uh, the, initial, the log of the initial population size to uh, predict population size at time t. So we can uh, try to do this on the Yellowstone grizzly bear example. So that's data from a um, uh, the uh, paper from Morris and Doak, but I think the original data were from an earlier study, Eberhardt, I think in 1986. So that's the, the population size of a uh, Yellowstone grizzly bear for from the 60s to uh, mid 90s, I think. So you see that at the beginning, the population was quite small and then uh, it was still small, 100 individuals at the late 90s, but at least it was increasing. So at the beginning, there were some uh, concerns because it was about 40 bears uh, before the, the 80s. So people were interested in running a population viability analysis to, to know the chances that this population could persist. Now it's much bigger. So I think there's less concern for these bears. So if we uh, use this uh, census data and try to run a deterministic PVA to start with. So you, we're gonna do that uh, in a bit uh, using the script that are in the live demo um, section of the website. But for now, we just go through the code here and then we, we run it together in a bit. So um, we just uh, upload the data, uh, population size, and the years for each census data. And we can calculate the log of the population size at time t plus one divided by a population size at time t. So it's the R rate of increase. We're not in the ideal world where the population would be growing at an exactly constant rate. So on real data, you can see that R is not just a single value, but it changes every year because some years maybe the population is going to grow a little bit more and some other years may, maybe it's declining a bit. So we have as many values of R, then we have um, years in the data minus one, minus the first one. So we take the mean value of the rate of increase and that's what we called mu, the mean rate of increase of the population. In this case, it's equal to 0.02. So it's bigger than zero, which means that the 
population, the grizzly population in average seems to be growing, okay? Because mu is bigger than zero. So in average, the population is growing, but still uh, the population is small at the beginning. So we want to have a better idea of the its viability. So let's project this population starting from uh, initial population size of 44 bears. So that was uh, just before the 60s. We are trying to project on the same number of years than the data series to, to compare our prediction with the real data. So it's uh, 30 years in our case. The, the number of time steps to project over, we also call it the projection depth, which means the yeah the number of years in this case that we run our model for. <clears throat> so we just calculated the mean rate of increase, which is equal to 0 0.021. So using these three quantities, we can project the population from one year to the next using the equation I showed you just before. So let's do it and we get the blue line, which is the predicted population size starting from initial population in 1959 by applying, multiplying by the mean rate of increase of the population every year. So what we see here is that the average trajectory of the population that we just predicted is um, not really doing a good job in uh, fitting the real data okay in the 80 in the 60s 70s we're overestimating real data i mean the the predicted population size is much bigger than the real data then it catches up in the late 90s with the last census but uh, um, but here we, in reality, we were concerned that the population could go extinct. And with this simulation, we completely missed that part. So the, the important thing to, to get from that is that uh, using only the mean rate of increase to project the population is not really recommended in cases, in cases where you, you are working with small populations because you see that we can uh, overestimate population size by only looking at the average trajectory, okay? So this kind of uh, very simple model with exponential growth work well for population that are actually exponentially growing, which you could see from the data from the start that is not really the case of the grizzly bear population until the 80s. So if we had run this simulation starting on the 80s for fitting this part of the cur curve, maybe it would have worked better. But here, clearly, we have first kind of a linear, like a plateau uh, up to the 80s, and then the population starting to grow. So better to use deterministic model for exponentially growing or declining, but uh, linear uh, exponential growth of population. And it's also uh, working better if environmental variance is low. Here you see that there is a year-to-year -year variation in population size, which is not too big, so that was kind of okay in this case. So how can we do better? Um, and something that we can do is to account for environmental variance that we have in the data and use this estimated enver enver environmental variance to, um, to project the population. So remember, we said that uh, the rate of increase follows a norm is distributing according to a normal distribution with a mu that is the mean rate of increase and a certain variance, sigma square, that is the environmental variance that we completely ignore to project the population because we just used mu. We can actually um, uh, use environmental variance. So the, the amount of variation from year to year that, uh, that, are in, that we can see in the data time series, we can use it to project the population. So if uh, the mean rate of increase is less than zero, it's 
quite likely that the population can go extinct. But if it's bigger than zero, it doesn't mean that uh, the population will grow for sure, because uh, the population can still go extinct or decline because of environmental variants, okay? Especially for small population. Even if it's growing slowly, just because uh, there are random variation from one year to the next, it can uh, drive the population to extinction. So we really want to account for that in the population viability analysis. So now we are running um, stochastic PVA in which we include uh, environmental stochasticity, so random fluctuations in environmental conditions from one year to the next. What happens in reality is that uh, because some years the conditions are a bit better or just uh, because of the structure of the populations in terms of age and size, survival rates, reproductive rates can be a bit better or um, less good from certain years. And imagine you can have a series of unfavor unfavorable uh, environmental conditions in a row that could potentially drive small populations to extinction. So, um, as I just said before, uh, it's better to not ignore environmental variants when we're trying to assess extinction risk. And this is especially important for small population. So let's run a stochastic PVN, PVA. <clears throat> so uh, the principle here is to project the population not only using uh, the average rate of increase of the population, but uh, annual series of rates of increase, which account for potential variance in the environment from one year to the next. Because it's random, we have to run the model several times because each uh, population trajectory is going to be unique. So imagine you generate a sequence of a rate of increase for the population with a rate of increase for each year. It's good to run it at least 100 times and most of the time 500 times to have a good idea of all the possible trajectories of the population. It's giving you a kind of a confidence interval around the average population trajectory that we predicted before. And using all the simulated populations, then we can calculate interesting quantities, such as the probability that uh, the population can go extinct, or the distribution of population sizes that we could expect at uh, certain uh, times, instead of just having a mean value. So let's do it on the grizzly bear example. We just uh, calculated the R, the log of the ratio of population size. In the first simulation, we just used the mean value of uh, rate of increase. Now we're also going to be using the variance of the log of ratios of population size, environmental variance. Mu still equals 0 0.021 which give us the average rate of increase and environmental variance in, the, in this case is 0 0.01. So as we said before, mu is positive. So on average, the population is growing, but it doesn't rule out uh, potential de decline or even extinction because of environmental variance, which in this case is uh, relatively low, 0 0.013. So let's uh, calculate confidence intervals for mu and uh, sigma. So we uh, mu uh, is uh, distributed normally, so we can calculate a confidence interval like uh, for uh, normal distributions using Q norm in R, which is the distribution of the quantiles of the normal distributions. We use the standard deviation of the log ratio and the square root of uh, population size, in which uh, in our case is the number of years of data points in the data. Okay. 
So we can see that uh, the confidence interval for the average rate of increase encompasses zero. So it doesn't uh, rule out a potential risk of decline, okay, when we consider the confidence interval. And we do the same for the confidence to get the confidence interval for the variance, which uh, is distributed according to a chi square distribution. So that's a classical way of calculating in confidence interval for variance. So to project the population size, we need uh, to start from initial population number. So we take the first data point in uh, 1959, which was 44, if I remember well. We project the population over 50 years, and we have to set the new quantity, which is the number of replicates, the number of different populations that we simulate. Uh, so 500 is uh, a good number, uh, which gives us um, quite a, a a wide range of uh, population trajectories. We also have to uh, consider, uh, it, it's quite interesting to consider another, quant another quantity to set a quasi-extinction threshold. So uh, you could consider that the population go extinct if there is just uh, one bear left because it's not going to be able to, to reproduce and, and the population gr would never grow again. But in general, in conservation, we uh, people work with a, a minimum viable population threshold for the bear. Uh, 30, I think, was the number was uh, recommended by the, the, the state at this time, because below a uh, number of 30 bears, it becomes really hard to implement any management strategies to 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 uh, protect the population. So this uh, because the extinction threshold uh, can be based on uh, different uh, information uh, to, to decide what's the threshold for this specific population of this specific species that ensure to have a minimum viable population. So it can be based on uh, genetic uh, information to prevent alley effect or demographic stochasticity, just the risk that the, the population is so small that it can very easily go extinct because of random variation for one, from one year to the next. So that's generally based on uh, biological consideration and, of, and sometimes there are recommended numbers by the states or governments or conservation agencies. So yes, for, for the bears, it was the lowest uh, level of abundance at which it considered that it remained visible to attempt an, interver an intervention to prevent further decline. So 30 or then it raised to 40, I think, for this population. Well, so, um, so which means that in our simulations, we're going to consider that the population is quasi extinct if it goes below 30 individuals in the population. Okay, so when we are trying to count over the 500 populations that we simulated, how many of them go extinct, we consider that uh, all the populations that reach this uh, threshold of 30 individuals are going to be uh, extinct. So let's project the population uh, while accounting for environmental variance. So we iterate the population using the same equation than before, except that R is ju not just a fixed value of the mean rate of increase, but this time we account for uh, each uh, and each year, the rate of increase is going to be different. And for that, we will draw a value of R every year for every simulated population from a normal distribution with mu mean rate of increase and sigma square environmental variance. And we repeat this until the last time step for each run. So it's a bit longer than what we did just before. That was like a second, even less than that. So uh, a bit uh, more many lines in the code, but we're going to go through that together in a bit. We're going to um, store the 
population trajectories in an object that we can call a stock populations, for example, stock pop. So it's a matrix. I fill it with NAs to start with. It has a T rows for each year of the projection and 500 in this case, 500 columns for each replicate of the population trajectory. So we have, we're going to have 500 populations of 500 columns. We fill the first line with a initial population, N1, which was, I think, was a 40 for the bears. And we're going to repeat the projection for each run and each year of the projection. At each, for each run and each year, we're going to draw a rate of increase from a normal distribution with mean value mu, the mean rate of increase calculated on the data, and variance of this uh, normal distribution equals the environmental variance calculated on the census data. We draw this uh, value of uh, r at time t. We back transform it using the exponential function to get lambda. And we project, uh, we calculate population size at the next time step by multiplying population size at time step uh, t by lambda at time t. In the simulation, we want to keep track of how many population get extinct and when this is happening. So we check if population size at time t is less than the quasi-extinction threshold. And in this case, we set the population to zero. Okay. As soon as it falls below the threshold that we consider the minimum viable population, we say, okay, the population is extinct so that it cannot uh, grow again in the, in the simulation and we move on to the next time step. If we do this, we don't get just a single average trajectory, but, but as you can see here, 500 different population trajectories projected over 50 years, and there's a lot of variation between the different populations simulated. Remember that uh, I said before that the environmental variance for this data is relatively low. So that's log population size that is uh, plotted here, which means uh, population size is uh, is uh, very, uh, the different trajectories are very different from each other. So just because of random fluctuations from one year to the next, it's very hard to predict what's gonna happen. There's a lot of, uh, variation among the different simulated populations. So we try to summarize a bit these results. And uh, one interesting thing to look at is the distribution of population sizes among, among the 500 simulated pop at the last time step. So 50 years after initial population, how do the 500 different populations I simulated look like? So we see that uh, many of them have a population size of zero, so they get extinct. And then a lot of them are below 500 uh, bears and a few populations just because of random fluctuations have grown very, very big. Uh, yep. So 1,500 bear, this is very unlikely. <laughs> so we can compare the predictions to the data. So that's log population size and uh, time. And you see that uh, the average population is in blue and uh, the, the comfort, like the range of all the 500 populations is in gray. And you see that the average trajectory is really bad at capturing all the different um, population trajectories, that there is a lot of variability, okay? Um, yeah, so the average population growth rate doesn't do a good job at predicting what most population realizations would do, because the average trajectory was uh, not going extinct, but we saw that uh, not a ne negligible fraction of the 500 population can actually go extinct. 
So it's very important to account for environmental stochasticity in this case for small populations. So we can um, try to quantify a bit more the risk of extinction and the time to extinction for those populations that uh, went extinct. So the ultimate extinction probability is uh, the percentage of trajectories of uh, the 500 simulated populations that reached the minimum viable uh, populations threshold. So we said it was uh, 30. So how many populations, so I sum them, how many population had less than 30 individuals over the 500 populations simulated? And that's giving us the probability of extinction that is about 20% for the bears over the 50 years of the projection, okay? In the next uh, 50 years, 20% population, the risk of extinction was at 20%. We can look at cumulative extinction risk over the years, because um, as uh, we project for a longer time, obviously uh, the risk that some population will reach the extinction threshold increase. So extinction probability is not fixed. It just depends at what uh, um, time step you you look at it so you cannot only speak about talk about the extinction probability you have to say in how many years um, what's the time interval that you considered okay so you can see that is growing and, and the, the variability is growing with time the the longer you're trying to make predictions the more uncertainty there is so um if uh, we want to look at the time to extinction, the mean time to extinction is not really a good, uh, a good information because as we saw before, there are just a few population, population that can grow very fast just by chance. So the mean of time to extinction is gonna be biased. It's better to use median time to extinction that is uh, more robust to, uh, to this kind of uh, issues. So, we can uh, calculate the time that uh, each population took to get extinct. So the number of uh, time steps that it took to the population to get extinct. So how many time steps it was uh, over uh, zero in terms of population size for how long? And the value of the time to extinction for each population that got extinct, it's going to be the last time step before the population reach zero. Okay. And we can calculate, uh, we can just take the median, median value of the time to extinction. In this case, for the grizzly bear, it was about 12.5 uh, years that most populations, the median time to extinction. Okay, so we can plot that. Uh, among the extinct population, that's the time, the number of years it took the popula populations to reach the extinction threshold, and the median value, value is about 12.5 years. So that's giving you an idea of how long it takes to the population to get extinct. Then it's uh, very interesting to change the values of some parameters in your model and see how it can alter your conclusions. For example, how uh, risk of extinction will change if you change the value of initial population size. That's very interesting if you are planning a reintroduction program, for example. What's the initial population size that is big enough to minimize the extinction risks? You can also change the the value of the quasi uh, the minimum viable population threshold um, because uh, sometimes we realize that oh there are also genetic concerns for this population they're inbred so we actually need a, a bigger uh, minimum vi viable population size so let's see how the extinction risk changes if uh, the minimum viable viable population changes or uh, the amount of environmental variance, the bigger it is, probably the higher the extinction risks are going to be and the number of years 
over which we project the population. So as we just said before, if you're trying to project over a longer uh, period of time, you're going to have more uncertainty and also just uh, by construction, extension risks are going to be higher for a projection uh, on a higher number of years. Okay. So let's actually uh, run the code ourselves or yourself. So you just uh, need to open the script that is on the website on um, the live demo section. And we're going to run the, the Grizzly Bear data. So do you still see my uh, script? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the Grizzly data are in the package PubBio, which is a really cool package to run a PVA. We also load the ggplot package to make some uh, pretty graph. We can view the Grizzly data. So you see you have a first column for years from 1999 to 1997 and the number of grizzly bears in the population at each, uh, each year. So going from 44 in 1959 to 99 in 1997. Up. So let's rename uh, population size and years and plot the data. Okay, so here we uh, calculate the log ratio of population size. So that's going to be nt plus 1 because we don't include the first year of data and we divide it by nt because we remove the last year of data. Just so that uh, at each time step, we, for example, here for the first one, we divide n2 because we do not include the first year of data by n1. Here we're going to divide n3 by n2, etc. etc. So it's giving us log of population size at time t plus 1 minus log population size at time t. Okay, so a rate of increase at each time step. We take the mean value of the log ratio of population size, the rate of increase of the population, 0 0.02. And environmental variance is simply the variance of the log ratio. We can back transform this quantity to get an estimate of lambda 1.02. So as we saw before, in average, the population is growing because lambda is bigger than one. Uh, let's project the population. <clears throat> starting from uh, 1959, but we could actually decide to set another time for the projection. So this is up to you. Huh? So I choose to uh, use N1, 44 bear, as in 1959, as the initial population size for my projection, and to project over uh, 50 years. Let's run stochastic simulations. So we need to replicate the number of uh, simulations. Let's take 500. Create an empty object to store the results. Set the initial population size in the simulations. So we say you can look at this uh, object. Um, and you see that we created a big matrix with uh, 50 rows because we ran the projections for 50 years and um, 50 columns. Uh, no, that's probably 500. Yep, 500 columns because we replicate the simulation for 500 virtual populations. And we fill the first line, the first year, for the 500 populations to 44, which is our initial population size. Um, in the classes, we set the quasi-extinction threshold to 30 bears. Let's say uh, we increase it because we realize that um, 
um, I don't know. Um, there are some good reasons to think that 40 bears is uh, the minimum viable population size. So let's uh, set it to 40 and see how it will change the results. So now we can uh, run the projections for each run. For each year of the projection, we're going to draw a random value from a normal distribution for the rate of increase. So let's try to just run one. You see, oh, for this year, it's minus 0 0.1. So that would be a bad year for the this simulated population because the population would decrease just a little bit. Then we calculate the lambda and we iterate the population by multiplying population size at time t, min t minus one by lambda to get population size at time t. Okay, let's do it. You see it's still very quick. Let's have a look at the results. Up for the first run, we see that the population is going extinct after the six years because it reaches the threshold of 40 individuals. The second population is going extinct right away at the second time step. The third one at the sixth time step, the fifth one, it's actually growing. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, at it with a plot. We just see the 500 populations here. Some of them are going very big because that's log of population size. Um, let's uh, see the distribution of population sizes at the last time step. So you see that when we increase the minimum viable population threshold to 40 instead of 30, many more populations are going extinct. So let's calculate the... Okay, so we compare predictions to observation and let's calculate the probability of extinction. Oh, it's now 56%. Okay, so it's bigger. We had 20% in the class when we set a 30 bears uh, threshold for minimum viable population. Now it's 30, 56%, so quite big. I want to look now at the cumulative extinction probability. So you see that in average, it's... Uh, more than 60% after 10 years, and it reaches about 70% in the next 50 years. Let's have a look at the time to extinction. Three years, median time to extinction. So the population go extinct very quickly. That's not surprising because we started for a very small, from a very small population of about 40 bears and we just said that the minimum viable population size was 40. So because we started very close to the this threshold, many populations went extinct just uh, right after, very quickly after the stimulation started. So we have a medium time to extinctions of three years. Okay, so you can probably take some time to go through this code by yourself. I just have a, a one or two uh, slides left um, to sum up of what we just said. So uh, count-based extinction probability uh, analysis relies on, on strong hypotheses. We just assume that the data we use are exhaustive, exhaustive counts, counts, so we do not uh, consider sampling errors on the estimate of population size. There are some models that can do this, uh, for example, state space models, but that a bit more uh, that include a bit more complex model than what we just use now. We did not include density dependence and consider that the population was exponentially growing and that the only source of variation was environmental stochasticity. So no demographic stochasticity, no trend in the mean environment or variance over time, and 
we did not include correlation about su successive years in the environment. So you can do this, but it requires uh, to add a few additional steps to the model. That was just an introduction. And also we considered that environmental variability was uh, around a mean value. We simulated rate of increase around the mean uh, considering a certain environmental variance. But in some cases, when when there can be catastrophic events with very bad things happening, that would not go, uh, do a good job in uh, reflecting this kind of scenarios. So we're going to see in the next class how we can do that in a different way. Uh, still, the Conbase PVA uh, have uh, many advantages because it's very simple. The only thing you need to have at hand is uh, census data. Uh, the recommendation are that uh, you have to have at least 10 years of uh, 10 intervals of census, but it really depends, as uh, we said at the beginning of the class, it really depends on the species and on the type of census data that you have. If it's a lot of uncertainty, if it's a lot of temporal variance, then it's very important to have a longer time series, otherwise it's just going to be a lot of uncertainty. And when you use good data to run the PVA, it works actually relatively well if the assumptions are met so that the population growth of decline is actually exponential. And it's really interesting because uh, even if the assumptions are not met, you can check uh, by hint casting what we just did, like projecting your population on the same time series than your data to compare uh, the data with the predictions. And this is a very good in, in it gives you a hint of where, whether your model is good enough or whether it's predicting things that are completely uh, different from uh, what you observe in the data. And you can improve your model to get closer to the, the real trajectory. So always uh, keep a critical eye on your results. It's a lot of uncertainty and don't forget to assess the quality of your data and uh, sampling protocols to have a to run a better, more robust PVA. In any case, um, running a PVA on count data is uh, not uh, informing about the functioning of the population because lambda, the growth rate or R, the rate of increase, it's only a summary of the population dynamics. So you don't have any precise information about the mechanisms that govern the population dynamic, and in particular, on which parameter you can act to, for example, uh, uh, ensure that the population uh, like uh, favor a better uh, increase or prevent the decline of a population or regulate a population. You don't really know on which demographic parameter it's uh, most efficient to act. So it's not really informative to, to set up some management actions. So we're going to see in the next class what other type of models, the matrix population models we can use to, uh, to have a look at the, the mechanism that govern the population dynamics. So let's have a 10 minutes breaks and start again at, uh, uh, okay, so what time is going to be 11, uh, 5 past 11 for us in France at least. So let's see you in uh, 10 minutes. Okay. So we're back. So in the second part now, we're going to see how to assess population viability, this time from demographic parameters, so that, so that we, get, we gain a, a better understanding of the, the mechanistic um, functioning of the population. So we're going to be using matrix population models in this part. So lastly, matrices that you probably heard of someday. 
So let's start and uh, assume for now that uh, we have no emigration or immigration in the population. We could write that uh, survival rates and fecundity rates uh, fully describe the population dynamics. So we can write the following equation. Population size at time t plus one equals the number of individuals in the population at times t times fecundity. That would uh, be the number of new babies uh, born in the population plus the number of individual, individuals in the populations at time t that have survived, so times survival rates. And that would be enough to fully describe the changes in the number of individuals in the population from one year to the next. So um, the problem is that in general, for most species across the tree of life, one survival rate and one fecundity rate is not enough to describe the de demographic parameters of all the individuals in the population. Uh, we say that demographic parameters are heterogeneous, heterogeneous across the tree of life. So basically, young individuals uh, will not have the same survival and fecundity rates than older individuals, for example. So species are structured uh, within a species, individual are structured in different life stages or age classes, depending on the species. And one set of demographic parameters is associated with each uh, age class or stage uh, in, the, in the population. So you saw uh, just uh, in the class before with Olivier, uh, how you can estimate uh, survival rates and uh, transition rates between states that uh, sometimes uh, correspond to uh, breeding rates or fecundity rates, how you can estimate them, for example, using capture, recapture, multi-states models for uh, wild populations. So once you estimated these parameters with capture, recapture models, you can um, use them to project the different life stages of the population. So you, you're going to use them to feed your matrix population models that is structured by age or stage. So let's take uh, the example of the barn swallow. Uh, it's a bird species that is a partial migratory. So in spring, so they spend uh, here in France at least, uh, they spend the winter in the tropics. They come back in spring for breeding uh, in the Mediterranean area. So they have a first, um, they have a, they raise uh, two or three clutch clutches and the, during the summer and they, all the birds uh, breed at the same time. So there is a one season of reproduction in the year and it's synchronous for all the individuals of the population. Then in autumn, they, we usually see them gathering in, in flocks before they, they migrate again to uh, their wintering areas and they come back the year after and they breed all together the year after, etc. So we can uh, summarize the life cycle of the barn swallow using um, five demographic rates. So uh, we have uh, S0 that is the survival rates of uh, individuals from birth to their first birthday, so first year survival. S1, that is annual juvenile juvenile survival rate, so for the yearlings, and S2 for the adults, so individuals that are uh, one, uh, two years old or three years old, and few of them will uh, remain alive, alive after that, but we consider that they all have the same survival rates after their second birthday. Fecundity rates uh, is the number, fecundity here is the number of females produced by a juvenile female. Why are we just counting female? Uh, we will get back to that in a bit, but in uh, in this example, we're going to use a one-sex model. So we're just modeling the female 
part of the population. That's why we count just the number of females produced by a female, okay? It doesn't matter so much in uh, most of the cases to just consider the females because they are the one driving the demography. In cases when males are not uh, limiting resources and uh, when the sex ratio is balanced in the population. So if you just model uh, females, and then you multiply the resulting population by two, you'd have an estimate of the total population size, okay? We'll discuss this a bit later, but for some species, it's better to use two sex model, okay? We'll get back to that. Uh, so you have here the number of females produced by a juvenile, juvenile female is F1, and F2 is the number of females produced by an adult females. Okay, so juvenile and adult don't have the same fecundity rate. And first year birds, bird have a fecundity of zero. The before one year old, they don't reproduce. So one very important uh, question you should ask yourself is uh, when is the timing of uh, data collection compared to the breeding season of the species. So this type of models apply to species that uh, have a synchronous breeding, so they reproduce all at the same time. And the timing of data collection can be before that or after that. And it makes uh, an important difference in the way that we're gonna write the model. So we're gonna see uh, both pre-breeding census and post-breeding census and show you the difference. That's a very common source of uh, error for um, beginners when writing a matrix population model and not only for beginners. Um, there are a lot of mistakes in the literatures in the way that people write their mat matrix model because they forget to, to, to consider the timing of data collection. So if it's a pre-breeding census, for example, if you come and monitor the population in May for the barn swallow, you come and count the number of individual or, or, or uh, recite the bird to estimate the survival, and you, you're going to set your population model as a pre-breeding model. So imagine you want to count the population just before the newborn are produced. So here we say that we, we count the population in May and uh, the breeding season with production of the chicks is in June. Okay, pre-breeding census. A post-breeding census would be if we would uh, count the population or project the population size in July. In this case, we would count also the chicks that are already born in the population and we would observe them directly. So first, uh, let's consider a pre-breeding census. Okay, so this situation where we set our model to project population size in May, just before the chicks are born. We can uh, decompose the different steps uh, until we write the matrix, uh, the transition matrix to project the population. We can start by writing the agenda of events. This is just a very uh, uh, um, decomposed way of doing things to, to avoid any errors. So census is in uh, May, breeding is in June of the same year. So if we come uh, in May, we do not observe uh, chicks. We just observe juvenile that we can uh, note uh, call A1 and adults A2 plus in the population. So at the next census, May year T plus one, we will observe the juveniles and the adults. The juveniles, the, the probabilities that the juvenile, juveniles, the A1 of year T survive and become adults year T plus one is S1, survival so rate of juveniles. And the probability that adults year T survive and remain in the uh, alive adults at time T plus one is S2. Plus, 
we're going to have the newborns that are born in June that will have grown to become juveniles at time t plus one. So there will be F1 uh, females produced by the juvenile at time t plus F2 females produced by female adults at time, time t. Among them, uh, some of them, so S0 times uh, the chicks will survive and become juveniles at time t plus one. So to write down the life cycle, we need to include all these pos possible movements of individuals from one age class to the next between the, the two years. So production of new individuals via reproduction are the pink arrows and survival of existing individuals and transition to the older age class are the green arrows. So we can just go back the different arrows to make sure we consider all the different uh, flows of individuals in the population to write down the life cycle. Note here, one thing that is important is that in a pre-breeding census, we do not observe chicks directly, okay? We come here in the population at time t and here at time t plus one. So when we write the life cycle, we just have the A1 and the A2 not the chicks because we do not observe them directly in a pre-breeding census. So you write your two uh, compartments of individuals in the population as circles A1 and A2 and you represent with arrows the flows of individuals from one year to the next. So A1, so uh, A1 are produced by a1 of last year that reproduced and grow into juveniles with probability F1 time F0, S0. So that's going back these arrows, okay? It represents the production of new individuals that are not directly observed because they're born after census and only a portion of them have survived to become juveniles. Um, juveniles at time T plus one can also come from adults the year before via production of new individuals that have survived. It's this arrow that are represent here from A2 T plus one at time T to A1 at time T plus one. The A2 at time T plus one come from the A1 at time T that have survived and the adults A2 at time T that have survived and remain alive as adults. So this arrow and this arrow. So we uh, represented all the possible flows of individuals in between the demographic compartments of the population. We have the life cycle. S0, F2, S1, and um, F1. You know uh, the value thanks to your capture recapture monitoring or um, uh, monitoring of the reproduction in nest boxes for some species or observation of uh, young. So we assume here that you have estimated by uh, one of this way the demographic parameters of the of your species. You can also have them from the literature, uh, of course. So if you know this parameter, you can uh, translate this life cycle graph that is also called Caswell representation into equations. Here we have two age classes, so we're gonna have two equations. The number of A1 at time t plus one, it's gonna be the new individuals produced by the juveniles A1 last year. So F1 time S0 time N1, that's uh, this arrow, plus the new individuals produced by the adults a2 last year, F2 time S0 time N2, and that's this arrow, okay? For the adults, the number of adults A2 at time T plus one, it's gonna be the number of juveniles at time T, A1 that have survived. So time S1, that's this arrow, plus the number of adults at time T, A2 that have survived, so times S2, and that's this arrow. 
So we, uh, uh, it's very, very important to make sure that you do not forget any possible transitions between demographic compartments. So uh, a trick to write this equation, uh, to avoid mistakes when writing these equations is to uh, make sure that the number of arrows here correspond to um, that each arrow here is represented in your equation. Okay, it's a bit hard at the beginning, but you get used to it and whatever species you're working on, it's always the same principle. So if, if you're able to correctly write down the life cycle of uh, your species, then once you've done it a few times, you're going to be able to write down the equations uh, easily. If you just uh, store uh, these parameters, uh, into a matrix, it makes things uh, much easier than from a computational point of view. Uh, first, because you don't have to work with several lines of equation. Ima imagine, for example, a elephant population. You have like 60 plus age classes. You'd have 60 lines of equations. It's easier to store the parameter in a matrix. And then you can simply multiply um, the number of individual in each age class at time t by what we call the transition matrix or the projection matrix to get population size at time t plus one. So uh, if we um, if we write this matrix for the sparrow, uh, we have a, a first year survival or of twenty percent. Juvenile survival of 50% and adult survival of 65% that was estimated uh, using a capture capture models. And fecundity of uh, juvenile female of uh, 1.5 females produce per year per juvenile female in average. And uh, six divided by two because uh, in this population, uh, we consider a balanced sex ratio and we just want to count the number of uh, female. So this means that in average, an adult female produced, produced six uh, chicks uh, per season and we divide it by two because we just want to count the number of females in the population. So this is all tracking only the number of females in the population. So uh, if we replace the parameters in the matrix by their value, uh, it's giving us the transition matrix here, setting the number of new individuals that will enter the population and the number of individuals that survive in the population from, uh, I mean, the probabilities that we multiply by the number to get the transition to the next time step. Okay, so uh, we've done it for the pre-breeding census. Now uh, let's see what is the difference if we had a post-breeding census. So if we want to model the population in July, the number of individuals in the population in July, just after the breeding season, so when the chicks are born already. So we want to model the number of chicks. So we would do this, for example, for species uh, that uh, uh, nest in nest boxes or uh, that you can easily monitor the reproduction and, and go and count the number of chicks, uh, observe the adults at the moment just after the reproduction. Okay, that would be easier to write a post-breeding census. So it really depends on your, on your study case. Both are possible. So... Post-breeding census, we now observe the chicks, A0, the juveniles, A1, and the adults, A2. From one year to the next, uh, they can, the chicks can survive with probability S0, the juveniles with probability F1 uh, and become juveniles, the juveniles with probability S1 and become adults, and adults remain in adult age, cl age class with probability S2. Plus, and this is the difference with the pre-breeding census. Now we are in a post-breeding census. So reproduction happened just before the census. So the newborn, they will have grown into juveniles, as we just said, 
before the next census, so they can actually reproduce just before the census. So juveniles A1 with probability F1 with, will produce uh, new uh, chicks, and adults with probability F2 will produce um, new chicks also. So all the arrows uh, represent the potential flows of individuals with certain probabilities from one year to the next. Okay, so you see this is a bit different because the newborn here, the first they need to survive and be called juvenile, and then they can reproduce just before the next census. So let's write down the life cycle. This time we have three demographic compartments and we represent all the arrows that show the movement of individuals in between the different compartments from one year to the next. So this can be a bit surprising because it seems like chicks can produce chicks with probability S0 times F1. And this is because from one year to the next, because you are just post-breeding senses. It's actually the chicks grow and become juveniles who reproduce and produce new chicks. Okay, so the life cycle look a bit different from the pre-breeding one. So we arrange that, uh, we translate it into equations as we did just before. We make sure that we uh, have all the arrows represented, uh, the number of individuals, the A0, it's going to be uh, A0 F1 times A0 time T plus S1 F2 times A1 at time T plus S2 times F2 A2 at time T. Okay. For A1, it's going to be S0 A0 at time T. And for A2 at time T plus 1, it's going to be S1 times A1 at time T plus S2 times A2 at time T. So you just go back the arrows pointing towards one circle to uh, write your equation. So we have three equations because we have three demographic compartments in the populations. So the matrix is going to be three lines and three columns, and it's going to give you the number of individuals in each age class at time t plus one as a function of the number of individuals in each age class at time t. So why is the matrix format interesting? Well, it's easier to read than uh, several equations and it also have interesting numerical features. So we'll get back to it in a bit, uh, which will make our life easier meaning that uh, for a deterministic model, we don't have to actually multiply the population each year by the matrix when we run the projection. If we have the matrix, we can directly know the quantity of interest, like growth rate or age structure, just from the matrix. So we'll see that in a bit. And the interesting thing about the mat matrix format is also that uh, Whatever species you're working with, you always be able to write the life cycle as a matrix format. Even if you have many age classes or stages in the population, you can end up with a matrix summarizing the life cycle of the population. So it means you can have transition matrix for many species that are available and they're all in the same format. So this is the Compadre and Comadre database that was set up by um, Rob Salguero Gomez and other people. Um, and it's online, it's free to use, and it's got uh, at the moment more about 800 uh, species of plants and about 400 species of animals for which uh, you can download the transition matrix the matrix summarizing the life cycle of the population is based on published species published studies sorry um, so if for example you work on a species for which uh, you don't have enough data to estimate uh, properly demographic parameters maybe uh, you can still try to run a first projection or uh, using 
published data uh, for this species. Uh, sometimes um, you can find information, missing information. For example, if you don't have fecundity for the juveniles, maybe you can find someone that have studies with same species and uh, the, the matrix, the demographic parameters are, are going to be available in this database. So it's a really cool um, database. Um, I'm going to show you a few examples of how you can integrate uh, different types of information into the life cycle. For example, here it's uh, for the barn swallow if uh, we consider two sites of reproduction. You would just uh, have to include the geographic sites as uh, cycles or uh, compartments in your population. This way you can model the immigration rates and emigration rates from one side to the other, just as a flow of individuals between your, your site. Which, which means that your uh, matrix is now going to be uh, four lines and four columns, because you have four compartments in your life cycle. And you have fecundity rates, survival rates, plus an additional parameters that I call D here, which is the uh, dispersal rate between one site to another site. So you can set these parameters D to be equal from one site to the next, to from site A to site B, or to be different from site B to site A, whatever, depending on your on your study case. And you could uh, also model that when you're trying to estimate the demographic rates using your multi-state multi -state capture recapture models to be able to estimate these different parameters. So you see, you can uh, it's very flexible. You can write um, in the matrix format different types of model with so several sites here. An example, another example here would be for a species with variable age at first reproduction. You would include data, that type of information by account by including, for example, a non-breeder A1 stage and a breeder age one state for the slender bill girl that all individuals do not start breeding where, when they're one. Okay, so your state in this case, it's not just age class, but it's coding also the information of uh, breeding state. So you would model the transition between the non-breeding state to uh, imagine an individual, some individuals remain non-breeder when they become adults, if they do a sabbatical, for example. And you can model the transition from non-breeding state to breeding state with probability of survival times probability of becoming a breeder. So the new parameter you need to introduce here, the Psi, would be the age-specific recruitment probability, so the probability of becoming breeder. So in the Lacey matrix, you now have fecundity rates, survival rates, and also times probability of becoming breeder, which is the probability of transition from non-breeder state to breeder state at each time step. Another example for a plant species, the peony, this time the matrix is not uh, structured by age, but by stage. Uh, stage can be a uh, seed, the plant can remain seed for one or two years, or three years, then it can become a small uh, plant, a, a small seedling, then it can grow to a vegetative tall plant V, and it can also uh, become a flowering plant. Okay, so no age structure, but a stage structure. And you can model the transitions of individuals in between the different stages in the population. So that's called transition probabilities. So for example, TPP is the transition probability from uh, but probability to be a plant and to remain a small plant. TVF is probability to be a vegetative tall plant and to become a flowering plant the next year. So you can model the transition between the different demographic compartments in the population. 
there's a wide diversity of uh, matrices depending on the species. It's better structured by age or stage. So typically, we call a matrix uh, structured by age a Lacely matrix, and it's uh, this uh, structural uh, shape. It's always the same. The fecunditys are on the first line of the matrix, and the survival rates are uh, diagonal and gives the probability of remaining alive in the population from one year to the next. It's going to be a zero in the bottom right corner for species that have a definite or a maximum age at death. Or it can also be a S max if you don't know maximum age at death. And as for, for the barn swallow, we just said we have a A2 plus age class and the survival probability in the adult age class. There is a chance that the individuals survive and remain in the A2 plus age class. Okay. Uh, a stage structured population um, matrix is called Lefkovich matrix. So this time is not ages, but stages, which give the probability to go from one demographic compartment for from one year to the next. Fecunditys are on the first row generally. And you don't only have survival rates in the diagonal, but you have the probability of transitions, time survivals in between each stage of the population. So your, mat your transition matrix is always going to be a matrix uh, which control the transitions of individuals from between the demographic compartment but uh, they can be structured by age or stage. And stage can be uh, whatever information like uh, epidemiological state, breeding state, geographical area, or uh, whatever is uh, the best for your study case. Okay, so let's uh, first uh, use this uh, matrix to project the population in a deterministic way to make it simple. So for the swallow, we write down our transition matrix on R using the demographic parameters that I presented you before. So we have the juvenile and the adults because we are now using the pre-breeding census. We can set an initial population size Compared to the first part of uh, the class uh, with the census PVA, we just had one census. Now we have to specify the number of individuals in the population in each demographic compartment. So here we say, imagine we have 50 juveniles and 30 A1 and 30 A2 plus at the initial state. We project the population to the next year by multiplying the number of individuals in the population at time t times the Lacely matrix that is uh, usually uh, denoted A. So in R, that would be multiplying the swallow uh, Lacey matrix by the initial population size <clears throat> to get uh, population size at the next time step. So be careful here when you do a matrix product in R, it's the percent star percent. So we're going to make sure you multiply the juvenile by the right uh, parameters in the matrix and the adults also by using a matrix product. Um, so if we want to project the population for the next 10 years, we multiply initial population size by Lacey matrix at raised to the power t. Okay, so in R, that would be this formula initial population size times the matrix power t. So we project using the matrix for the next t time steps, 10 years. You can write that by hand in R, or you can use, in, use the package PubBio which is specifically uh, designed for that and offer a cool um, way of arranging the results. So that would be doing the same thing here, but using the function called pop projection, you uh, give it the transition matrix for your species, then initial population size and the number of iterations you want to project over. 
So here we project the population for 10 years. We can plot the results and we see that we have two lines. One is the number of A1 juveniles in the population and the purple line is the number of adults in the population. What we see is that we have a first uh, transitory stage at the, until the third iteration here or four, where the two lines are crossing. And then we can see that there is a stabilization of the proportion of juveniles and adults in the population. And then the population is growing exponentially. exponentially. So the transient dynamics, the first phase here, it really depends on the initial population size. And the damping ratio is uh, controlling the time um, to uh, reaching the equilibrium or the stationary phase where the proportion of individuals in each age class stabilizing and remain constant and grow at a constant growth rate. So depending on the initial population size, if it's very different from the, the stationary phase, it will take a bit longer to reach the stationary phase. The stationary phase, it's independent on the initial conditions. It just depends on the transition matrix only. So it's very cool. It means that if you know the transition matrix, you actually don't have to run the simulation to know the proportion of individual in each stage of the population and also the asymptotic growth rate of the population. Because in the stationary phase, stationary phase, you see that each age class is growing at a constant rate. And this is the asymptotic population growth rate lambda, because this is a deterministic model. So if we know the Lacey matrix, we can directly calculate this quantity without having to run the projection. So we're going to know, in average, is the population growing or declining? So it's very, very interesting. We can also know directly from the Lacey matrix the stable age or stage structure in the population. So the proportion of individuals in each demographic stage when we reach the equilibrium phase. So um, that's interesting information that you can get from the projection matrix. So let's see how the results are structured if you if we will use the PubView package. First, we have the a list uh, of uh, elements in the results with the lambda of the population, the stable stage structure, the number of individuals in each uh, demographic compartment, the population's uh, sorry, yeah, the total population size and the rate of change in each demographic compartment. So if we take the first element here, lambda is bigger than one. In average, the population is growing. The stable uh, age structure is 44% of, of juveniles and 55% of adults in the population. If you can actually compare this number to the one you observe in your population, it's giving you an idea of how far you are from the equilibrium. We expect a population to be at equilibrium if it's not disturbed, which is a very rarely the case in, a, in nature, so in the wild. So if you have a very different number in your data, it means that your population has been perturbed recently, for example, via hunting or modification of the environment. You can look at the number of individuals in each uh, age class uh, through time and total population size and a rate of change from one year to the next. And you see that it's stabilizing to uh, 1.05, which is the asymptotic growth rate of the population. So here is uh, the first time step is a bit different because it's the transitionary phase and very quickly we converge toward, towards 1.05 when we reach the asymptotic phase. So as I said, we can directly, without running the projection, know uh, the stable population growth rate with, uh, if we have the Lacey matrix. So that's the function lambda, and it's giving you the asymptotic growth rate. 
same for the stable stage uh, distribution. Also for the reproductive value, so it's giving you the relative contribution of each age or stage uh, to the next generation. So the first age class is always a one, and the second value, it's giving you the relative contribution. So here we know that adults contribute 1.5 more individuals to the next generation. That's because they have a higher survival and also a higher fecundity. So that's helping you to identify the key compartments that control the dynamics of your population. We can now other quantities like generation time, which is the average age of mothers at birth of their daughter. So that's going to be longer for long-lived species and shorter for short-lived species. It's interesting to compare it in between different populations of the same species, for example. And uh, we can uh, then perturb the model and see how it can change the dynamics of the population. That's something that is very interesting to do. For example, what happened if uh, adult survival for some reason, like uh, hunting or introduction of a predator or uh, whatever, um, collision or whatever, what happened if it's uh, decreased by 50%, for example? So I change this value in the Lacey matrix and I can calculate the I can, if I want, project the population and calculate lambda and see how the dynamic of the population will, will change. So it's very interesting because we can really play with the value of each demographic parameter independently or uh, on several pop demographic population at the same time to see which one control the dynamic of the population and which one are more important to act on if we want to protect or regulate a certain population. So when I modified adult survival, I see now that the lambda of the population is less than one. So the population is declining, which means that obviously adult survival is important for population growth. We can ask the same question, what if juvenile survival is reduced or if fecundity or chick survival is reduced? And we can uh, ask the same question for each demographic parameter. Okay, and that's gonna give us uh, an idea of which compartment or which demographic parameter are the most important and drive the population dynamic. And that's on this one, we want to focus our management actions when possible. So um, that's the objective of what is called sensitivity analysis. And the idea is to measure the impact of a change of a specific demographic parameter on the population dynamics. So sensitivity measure an absolute change, the impact of an absolute measure, measure the absolute change in population growth rate, lambda, when we vary a bit the value of any demographic parameter, that is called theta here. And elasticity measure the relative change in lambda when we change a bit uh, each demographic parameter. So that's a percent change in a parameter, whether sensitivity is an absolute change. So it's both sensitivity and elasticity are useful but elasticity is better if you want to compare parameters that are on different scales. For example, if I'm asking, is it more important to uh, control the fertility or the survival of the barn swallow if I want to control population growth rate? Fertility and survival are not on the same scale. Fertility is number of uh, chicks produced, survival is between zero and one. So I want to, lose, to use elasticity instead of sensitivity, sensitivity, because elasticity is gonna tell what's the impact of changing fertility by 1% compared to changing survival by 1% or by 10%, okay? They're not on the same scale. So make sure you use elasticity to compare the impact of acting on one of them. So um, that's how we're gonna run sensitivity, sensitivity analysis 
uh, on R, you uh, list the demographic parameters and write the expression that is in the Lacely matrix so that the model know, for example, if one cell of the matrix is a multiplication of two parameters. You could also decide to differentiate chick survival or, for example, uh, number of chick borns and then uh, number of uh, chicks survive uh, until hatching and then first year survival. So you could decompose into lower level parameter, the fecundity. Then you can use the function that is called vital sense. You provide the equation of the matrix and the matrix, and it's giving you the value of sensitivity and elasticity of lambda to changes in each of these demographic parameters. So it's very interesting. So if we plot this, we see that for the bound swallow, if we look at sensitivity, it is higher for chick survival. Uh, but if we look at elasticity, which is a proportional change of each of these parameters, we see that it's elasticity of adult survival that is the higher. So if I want to act on this population, it's better to act on adult survival than on other parameters. Chick survival has a bit lower elasticity. Fecundity has a really low elasticity. So even if you would act on like more habitat for uh, uh, more nest also, it would not apparently make a big difference to control the population. So really focus your action on adult survival here. That would be the message. So sensitivity analysis are really interesting and has really important implications for management because it helps you to identify key parameters and adapt uh, the, the best strategy. Here would be to reduce adult mortality if we want the population to, to grow. Uh, and it's useful to assess the, the impact of relative management action. And there is a really cool package that was just out in 2022. And you can actually implement a specific management action in the, in the simulations and see how it changes the dynamic of the population. There are examples on plants in the package, so you can try to have a look. It's really cool. We can have a break uh, now and start again at 2. We will um, go through the live demo and then a stochastic uh, stimulations for matrix models. Okay, so <laughs> I see you at two. Okay, hi everyone. We're back. Uh, okay, so this morning I left you after some classes on demo deterministic pop matrix population models. And now we're going to go through the code and uh, run the example on the barn swallow. And after that, we're going to talk a bit about uh, stochastic models. So, <clears throat> That's the live demo class three, and it's the second example. So I'm going to delete this plot. And for this live demo, we're going to use the PubBio package that we also used this morning. It's very easy to do to run deterministic models with that. It's got a these built-in functions to run the projections and calculate all the quantities that we are interested in. So that's the first we need to enter the demographic parameters for the swallow. 
you could have instead of these values, your capture recapture models here, and the output would be the parameters with the uncertainty associated with it. Here, we just assume that we got this value from uh, the literature or uh, just using the mean values here. We arranged them in the Lacey matrix that is built using the life cycle with two uh, rows for juveniles and adults at time t plus one, and two columns, juvenile and adults at time t. We, we assume that we have 50A1 and 30A2 in the initial population. So we set this parameter N0. And let's say we want to run the projection for 20 years. <clears throat> So to project the population, we just use this function, pop.projection. As parameters, we provide the list matrix, initial population size, and the number of years of the projection. OK, you see it's instantaneous, and we can look at the results with these uh, five components in the result list. And that's a deterministic uh, projection. So first, let's look at the population size for each age. So we have a, a matrix with the A1 in the first column and the number of individuals at each time step. Same for the adults. So we can probably plot this. We can plot the total population size. Let's do it now. I'm using matplot, but uh, you can probably do this in a nicer way using ggplot if you're younger than me. <laughs> so if you look at the projection, we have our two age classes, population size for the two age classes as a function of time. OK. So we see this uh, stationary phase and the transition phase. We can calculate the damping ratio, so the time it takes to reach the, the stable state. So 10.5 years here. So that would change if we change the initial population size and get longer if, we, uh, if the ratio of adults and juveniles in the initial population size is further away from the equilibrium. Let's calculate lambda, 1.05, so the population is growing. Stable state structure, reproductive value, generation time. So you see it's just a specific function for each of these quantities. And we could look at how these parameters change when we change some of the demographic parameter in the Lacey matrix. <clears throat> so that would be running a sensitivity analysis. So that's what we are trying to do here. I create an object that is called swallow.param with the different demographic parameters that are in the Lacey matrix, and then specify the equation of the Lacey matrix. And that's just useful in case you have several parameters that uh, are um, appearing in a single cell of the matrix. Like for example, here, the survival of the first year survival times number of females produced by a female. If you want to know the sensitivity of growth rate to these two parameters, you need to have a step where you decompose the different demographic parameters and the expression, the formula in the Leslie matrix. Otherwise, you would just uh, use the Lacey matrix if it was just one single parameter per cell. OK, so to run the sensitivity an analysis, the function is vital sense. Just run it and look at the results with sensitivity. So in absolute and elasticity, the proportional change in population growth rate when we change uh, the value of each demographic parameter. So the way uh, sensitivity and elasticity are calculated in this function is using uh, derivative equations. So it's uh, an, uh, 
analytical results, but we could also do it by hand if we wanted to by added by adding a specific quantity to let's say for example s0 plus a certain value and run the projection again and see by how much lambda would have changed okay so this is the generic result but you could also decide to to do it yourself with a changing adult survival by a specific value let's say okay so in case you want to test for the specific effect of uh, for the effect of specific management action, then it would probably make sense to to do it by hand. It would be easier. Or using the package uh, Ramas, in which you can uh, include specific management action on the different age classes. So that's the global sensitivity and elasticity for each demographic parameters. And as we said in the class, uh, sensitivity is higher for chick survival. But if we look at elasticity values, that is a proportional change, uh, uh, relative, yeah, we see that elasticity is higher for adult survival. So probably it's better to act on adult survival rather than on fertility uh, or improving fertility, for example. And that's it for this live demo with deterministic models. So um, a few words about um, the assumptions and the limitations of these models. As we said before, it's a one sex model in this case. There are two sex models that exist. I think I provide, provide some reference uh, further away. There, uh, you can model two sexes. So you'd have one matrix for the males, one matrix for the females, plus a mating uh, function. Uh, and this is interesting for species in which uh, sex ratio is not uh, balanced. And species, for example, like deers, in which uh, some males would uh, monopolize uh, most of the females and have a reproductive skew in a, a skew in reproductive success. So in this case, it would be interesting to model the two sexes. Otherwise, for most uh, species in which sex ratio is balanced, you can just use uh, female uh, population models. That's what people do in general in demography. <clears throat> so these models, in, which, in these models, we estimate population size in one point of time before of or after reproduction, um, but it assumes that all individuals in the population all breed, all produce offspring at the same time in one season. So it's a synchronous breeding. And for some species, it's not true, like for example, humans or um, elephants or other species that can produce uh, offspring at any time during the years. So in this case, you would have, uh, it would probably be better for some, uh, like uh, you could use a continuous time model if you want to look at uh, when the peak of birth happens in the year, etc. It would be harder to, to, to make the assumption that uh, the reproduction happen at just one point in, in time. <clears throat> um, we also assume that there is no density dependence, that the population growth is exponential, which is not true in all cases. So if you know that uh, there is a density dependence in your population because of uh, limited food resources or uh, availability of uh, breeding territory, then it's better to use a model including density dependence. Uh, I provide some reference also a bit later. And it works well also if you're working on a species that is recolonizing in or that is exploited, in which you know that it hasn't hasn't reached the the current capacity yet. So probably in this phase where growth or is exponential. Here we assume that demographic parameters are constant in time, but you could, um, as we're going to do now, include. Demograph uh, environmental stochasticity. You could also um, include 
the effect of covariate in your model, environmental covariate, and then you would use different Lacey matrix depending on the value of your environmental covariate, for example. So that's part of the stochastic, uh, um, except if you know exactly how the environment is going to look like in the future, but in general, we don't. Okay, so for now we assume no, no environmental stochasticity. So that was, that was just to look at the average population trajectory. So we, we discussed before that it's, uh, sometimes it's not the best option, especially if the environment is variable and if environmental uh, variance in demographic parameters is high. We assume no demographic stochasticity. And demographic stochasticity is important, especially in small populations. So when we say that survival probability is 0 0.8, uh, it could well be that some years just if among 10 individuals, not exactly eight would survive, okay? Uh, but just by chance, some of them will, some of them won't, same for the number of offspring. So that's just random individual uh, fluctuations. Um, and it can, uh, it can increase extinction probability, especially for small populations. So if you're working with small populations, it's, it's probably better to include demographic stochasticity in the models. But still, uh, these deterministic models are interesting to project the average population trajectory and um, in cases where environmental are stable and population is exponentially growing, as we just said before. And it's very interesting to run sensitivity analysis. Uh, more than just look at the average trajectory, the, this tool of sensitivity analysis is very useful to identify which are the key demographic parameters we should act on uh, when, uh, when trying to, to, to manage a uh, population. Okay. It can guide conservation actions. So deterministic models are, are interesting, especially for the sensitivity analysis. Okay, so when the environment matters, we turn to stochastic models that are a bit longer and uh, need some replicates and a bit more complex, but uh, it's probably worse um, including uh, environmental stochasticity when uh, we know that environmental conditions matter and are viable. So demographic rates uh, vary over the years. We don't understand always exactly why, but we know that from one year to the next, sometimes survival will be better or lower, same for reproductive rates. And this can alter the long term, the long run population growth rate. So imagine that uh, for some uh, reason, maybe uh, there is a sequence of uh, consecutive bad years or good years, then especially if the population is small, this can increase the risk of extinctions. So stochastic uh, matrix population models, the, the idea behind it is to uh, construct a series of uh, stochastic transition matrices, so stochastic Leslie matrices, instead of using just the average uh, transition matrix, we generate one for each year randomly, I mean by sampling in a distribution, or we see, we're going to see how, and we use this sequence of matrices to project the population. So we have to repeat that several times as we did for the count-based PVA, to have a confidence interval around the average population trajectory. So first, we generate a sequence of uh, demographic parameters. I said a random sequence, but it's just not just random numbers, but we include some uh, stochasticity in the process of generating the matrices. We're going to see two different ways of doing it. Then we pile up the, diff the sequence of uh, transition matrices. And um, so one for each year, and we can use the sequence of matrices to project the population. Oh, there is a, something wrong here. Okay. Uh, one way to generate this sequence of um, 
transition matrices is to consider that there is random annual variation around the mean values of survival rate and uh, fecundity. So the deterministic matrix that we had for the for the barn swallow, we can start from there and then draw numbers of uh, survival for the first year survival, juvenile survival, adult survival and fecundity in a distribution with uh, the variance estimated from the data. So each year we draw a new value and we use this value to construct the annual um, transition matrix. And then we can project the population using this sequence of matrices. That's one way to do it. And it works uh, well when we know that there is uh, random variation around mean values. In other cases, we know that we can have two types of uh, environment, let's say uh, roughly good years and bad years, when there are some catastrophic events that can happen in the population, for example, drought or fire or uh, some years with a uh, a lot of uh, resources available and some other years with very few resources. For example, when population are bursting. Um, so in this case, instead of uh, drawing numbers around the mean value, we can say, okay, we have either a good year with this Lacey matrix that we can estimate on the field, for example, for normal years and another Lacey matrix for bad years, for example, drought years where uh, demographic parameters are much lower. We can set a probability of uh, uh, the occurrence of uh, good or bad years in the data. And using this probability, we generate a random sequence of, uh, we generate a sequence of uh, transition matrices. And we can vary the probability of occurrence of a bad year and see how it will affect the projection, the population trajectory. So once we generated the sequence of uh, transition matrices, we use it to project the population from one type step to the next. We cannot uh, use the, the, we cannot calculate the quantities of interest directly from the matrix because there is this stochastic part. So we have to run the simulation and, um, and uh, several times because each run is going to be unique because of these random fluctuations. So when we say several times, it's like before, it's at least uh, 500 times. And if the simulation is long, if the uncertainty is high, sometimes it's better to run it for a thousand even more. So you should, every time you run stochastic PVA, you should check how your results change when you change the number of runs of replicates that you run. That's part of the things you have to check. Um, and from these uh, stochastic simulations, we um, gonna derive and calculate some quantity of interest, like the risk of extinction, mainly, and the others we're gonna see right now. <clears throat> so we can look at the population sizes at the last iteration, stochastic growth rate, because it's not deterministic anymore, probabilities of extinction at different times, and a stable stage structure and generation time, all the other quantities that we calculated in the deterministic model. Okay, so let's take the example of the crested newt. That's an example provided by Olivier Duries that we use in a master class teaching. So they live in the mid south of France. There is a population and we can represent the life cycle with uh, three age classes. The immature individual that we call A1 they can survive and become subadults A2 with probability survival probability S1. The subadults um, can survive with probability S2 and become adults, and the adults can stay alive with probability F S3. This is a pre-breeding cycle, so we have a production of new individuals that will become immature with um, 
alpha 2, that is the probability of breeding of immature, that is not 100%, fecundity times the probability that the offspring will survive until the first birthday, so first year survival. And adults can also breed with a probability alpha 3, I think this is 100% for the adults, times the number of spring times survival first year survival of the offspring. This is also a one sex model, so it's just uh, females individuals. So fecundity parameter here uh, correspond to the number of female offspring produced by a female. In the case of crested newt, the sex ratio was uh, balanced, so I think you just divide the total number of offspring by two. So we can write the Leslie matrix uh, this way. The first row would be fecundity value. So new individuals produced by uh, immature and new individuals, uh, sorry, subadults produced by immature produced by subadults and immature produced by adults. Then uh, survival of immature individual, survival of adults individuals. Oh, sorry. Immature, subadults, and adults survival. So it's uh, structured in three age classes. In a deterministic model, we would just use this Lacey matrix to project the population <clears throat> and see the average trajectory. But for the crested newt example, we know that there is high interannual variation in demographic rates. So a capture-recapture study found that annual survival was 0.52, but varied between 22% and 75% during the eight years of monitoring. So that's a very high interannual variation. Fecundity, uh, was about 3.07 uh, females produced by an adult females, but it varied, varied from 0 0.3 to 5.4 in 10 years. So it's a lot. So we probably want to include uh, environmental variation, for example, by introducing some random variation around the mean values around these parameters and use that in our projection. I account for it. And there's um, um, also very uh, marked um, drastic changes between uh, years with drought. Uh, so if the ponds are completely dry in some spring, which happen about uh, one every three years uh, at the time of the study, then um, it induces quasi-complete failure of reproduction. It means that very dry years, fecundity will be zero instead of being three, uh, three females by females, okay? So we can also uh, try to model good and bad years with using uh, one out of three as the frequency of uh, very dry years and see how it changes our projection of the population. Okay, so let's try both methods. So if we start from the deterministic matrix, we can uh, draw annual values for each demographic parameters by sampling around the mean value of the distribution. So for that, we could use a logitlic function or here I'm using a truncated normal distribution because we are not so close to zero. So I, I constrained for a survival parameter, we can only sample values between zero and one. The mean uh, for uh, immature survival is the average immature survival with a standard deviation estimated from the data. Okay, uh, so here I use 0 0.15, but you could actually use the standard deviation of your uh, survival estimates obtained from the capture recapture model. Same for subadults and adult survival, and for uh, fertility values, except that uh, I'm using a normal distribution because the mean fertility was three point something, so I'm just sampling around this mean value. 
with the standard deviation, you could use also the one estimated from the data. Okay. So basically the idea is uh, to draw values from this distribution. So you could, here I'm using uh, normal distributions, but you could use directly the posterior distribution of your estimates obtained from the capture recapture models and sampled from this distribution. So by sampling uh, values each year from this distribution, I obtain, we, we obtain a sequence of transition matrices to project the population. So each year when we project the population, uh, we sample the value of each demographic parameter from this distribution. And we run the projections using this sequence of uh, stochastic transition matrices. We set, like usual, an initial population, the number of time steps to project over, and the number of replicates. It's good if it's at least a thousand in our case, because environmental variance is quite important. So there's probably a lot of uncertainty. So if we run the projection for 30 years, we can look at the distribution of population sizes at the last iteration. So we see that a lot of them are close to zero, which is not a very good sign for the newts. And a few populations have grown very, very big uh, just due to the random occurrence of several good years in a row with high demographic parameters. We can calculate the stochastic, the long run stochastic population growth rate. You have uh, using uh, the stock growth rate function from the PubBio package. And you can set the maximum time steps used to calculate this value. So the higher this value is, the more you'll be close to the theoretical long run stochastic growth rate, uh, it's going to be closer to the, the analytical value. But if you use a shorter number of iterations, it's going to be um, a bit more different because it's uh, an approximation. OK, so here, if we calculate it using 5,000 iterations, the two values, so the approximation and the ones, uh, sorry, the long run stochastic growth rate, using the analytical formula, it's very close to the one we calculate on the simulation, okay? So that's the growth rate, the average growth rate towards which the population is, uh, is tending to grow. So that's the equivalent of the, the, the deterministic growth rate. It's not the same value, but it's uh, approaching it as uh, the number of iterations increase. So if we exponentiate this value, uh, we get the lambda. Okay, so that was log of lambda, yeah, on the load scale. I didn't say it, sorry. So if we apply the exponential, we get a long run stochastic growth rate of 1.03, which uh, means that uh, in average, the population is growing. However, it doesn't prevent many populations from getting extinct. So we want to calculate the probability of extinction. And that's really what we, we're interested in, in this case. So using an initial population size of 50 individuals in each age class, the quasi-extinction threshold in the case of the newts, we use 30, but we could use uh, whatever value makes more sense. Uh, so that's very population specific. And if you don't want to use any quasi-extinction threshold, you can say that, okay, my population is extinct when it's just zero individual left or one individual left, okay? But we know that for the newts that are living in different ponds, uh, small population is very high, high risk of extinction. So 30 is probably a good threshold. We repeat this simulation for a thousand times over 50 time steps. So we project for the next 50 years. And we repeat that 10 times to get robust estimates of uh, extinction probabilities. 
of the distribution of extinction probabilities. So that's the so the the way that uh, extinction probability is calculated is the same than with the count based PVA over all the population trajectories that we simulate. We count the number that go extinct over the total number of populations at each time step. So we see that the five the first five years none of our 500 times 10, so 5,000 population got extinct. And then we have an uh, increase in extinction probability up to 0 0.015. So that's like 1% is very low over the 50 years of projection. Um, so less than 1% chances of extinction in the next 20 years. Okay, so that was uh, kind of encouraging for this population of newts, the way we modeled uh, environmental stochasticity. But as I said before, you can model it in different ways. And for the newts, it seemed that it made more sense to model it uh, using catastrophic events, because we know that when severe uh, drought happens, fecundity can drop to almost zeros in, in in certain years where the ponds are dry in spring because the, the 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 young will die certainly like okay almost none of them survive so let's uh, model uh, environmental stochasticity this way using good and bad years so in good years about three females produced by a female in bad years zero so we now have the good years Leslie matrix and the bad years Leslie matrix. We use these good and bad years as Leslie matrix to project the population. We said that at the time of the monitoring, there was about one uh, spring of dryness uh, of severe drought, sorry, where the pond was dry one out of three years. So we can use this frequency of uh, catastrophic events to generate the sequence of stochastic matrices. So the function is the same, stock.projection, and we uh, give it as an entry, a list of two matrices, the good and the bad. It reminds me of a movie. <laughs> So that's what is the is in our list with the good matrix and the bad matrix. So I called it a newt.kata. And then we uh, we provide the probability of a bad year happening and a probability of uh, sorry, the probability of a good year happening and the probability of a bad year happening. So be careful that uh, here uh, you put it in the same order than this order. So if the first matrix is the good year, here first you should provide the probability of a good year. Okay. Um, so two years out of two are good and one year out of three is bad. The initial population size we used 50, but you, you should probably use the population size you have, uh, the real population size you have if you know it. Here we can project over a hundred years, uh, which sound a lot because usually uh, it's very hard to make projections further away than the 15 next year. And it sounds even a lot given that the environment changes uh, quite fast in some areas at the moment. So hundred is maybe a bit too much, but it's good for the sake of the example. Okay, we repeat that a thousand times. Okay, let's do it. We run the stochastic projection, look at uh, lambda, 0 0.88. So you see now we're below one. So in average, the population is declining if we consider that uh, one year out of three in average, we have a bad year. So the way that we included uh, the environmental stochasticity, it's very important uh, because it changes completely changes here the, the fate of the population. We can um, calculate the probability of extinction. 
using uh, the same uh, function than before, stock.kazi.x. And if we look at the probability of extinction over the next 50 years, we see that it's uh, almost 100%. And after 10 years, it's already 40% of the populations that we simulated that got extinct. So it's much higher than if we just included some random variation over the mean values. So in 20 years, 80%, 83% uh, of the populations got extinct. So the probably risk of extinction is uh, high. So uh, we can play with this kind of model. Uh, it's very interesting to look at how, uh, when we change the amount of environmental variance, the risk of extinction uh, changes, especially if we have some hints from the field of how variable the environment is going to be in the coming years, we can use that and, and project the population in, in, as a function of, of what we know. Uh, at least, for example, in the south of France, we, we know that the frequency of uh, years with a severe drought is going to increase. So it would be interesting in this case, even if it's very scary, to project the population with increasing frequency of catastrophic events. And that can help us to make some predictions about how the risk of extinction can increase in the future with changes in the environment. We could just initial population size, the extinction threshold, and the number of years we project over. Okay, so let's try to do it then. Um, we're going to use the Christine nudes and uh, go through the code together. So that's um, the third uh, live demo up. You should have the script in uh, class three live demo. Uh, and it's uh, all in uh, one script for you. Up, so let's delete this. Um, okay, so we're going to use the package PubBio again to run the simulations with environmental stochasticity. Up. What did I do? Um, okay. So first we set the demographic parameters. Up. In case you know them. Otherwise, in this part, you could have your capture recapture models or whatever data and analyze directly, estimate them. Um, with your data. Then we create the deterministic Leslie matrix. And we can sample from uh, this deterministic, for uh, this average values of demographic parameters. We can first include annual variation around the mean values by drawing the annual parameters from a normal distribution. Okay, let's look at the generated values. Up. So we see that using the immature survival is around 0 0.5, can go to zero. So that's quite high variation that I simulated here, which corresponds to the data we, we had. It's a high interannual inter variance. Some adults is around 0 0.5, varies a lot, some for adults, and fecundity is around three. Okay. And we uh, use these values. So I generated uh, 1,500 values for each, and I'm gonna pick at each time step for each population, one of these values. So I'm going to sample from this distribution and pick one value to generate a sequence of stochastic transition matrices. Okay. 
So that's my piled up matrix is contained in this list that I call a.newt.se. So A for transition matrix, newt, SE, stochastic, stochastic, environmental stochasticity. And you see that you have a thousand and 500, we don't see the last 500, but we have 1,500 different Lacey matrices that are contained in the same list. And we use this list as an entry uh, for the stochastic simulations. So I want to simulate the population for 30 years, and I run the stochastic projections every year picking a different matrix, okay? Initial population size, we can change that as we want, and 1,000 replicates. Up, and it's very quick. We can look at population size, sizes. Here I just printed the six first years. Oh, sorry. Here I printed just uh, the last the population size at the last time step so the 50th year of the projection for each edge class and for the six uh, first uh, populations we simulated five, 500 of them so we can get the total population size by summing up the three age classes okay uh have a lot for a thousand 500 replicates. We can probably plot that instead of looking at the huge vector. Up. And that's the giving us the distribution of the population sizes at the last time step. So we have some of them getting extinct. A lot of them are small population sizes, and a few of them can grow very big. But we see that we have some extinction happening here. So let's calculate the probability of extinction and the long run stochastic growth rate. That's what we do here. Um, the approximation, so that's the analytical formula. And uh, calculating it on the simulations by counting, uh, by calculating the ratio of log population size with the confidence interval. So it's good to, to look at these different values. They should be relatively close to one another, especially if uh, you use a, a large number of iterations. And that's, that's useful really to know the average trajectory of the population. So this is below one when you exponentiate this value. If it's below one, it's very scary for the population. It means that in average it's, it's declining. Um, but then if it's above one, still it doesn't rule out that, uh, that there is a risk of extinction, especially if it's close to one, okay? So especially um, if we are interested, in general, we're interested in what's gonna happen in the, in the next years. That's more informative than just looking at the long run stochastic growth rate. So here we calculate the stochastic uh, probability of extinction by simulating all uh, this, uh, here is a thousand population over a uh, 50 time step. And we repeat that 10 times and we count the number of populations that uh, go extinct. And we can plot the risk of extinction. So there is a lot of variability in our simulations here. I mean, uh, it sounds like a lot, but if you look at the y-axis here, it's uh, the probability has, are actually very low. It's a, a, a low probability of extinction, okay? That was the first example when we generate parameters around the mean value. And now let's do the good and bad years. So very bad reproductive success, null reproductive success in years with a severe drought. We use these two good and bad matrices. We pile them up here in a list with the good, good year and bad year together in the same object. And let's say that, uh, oh, so at the time of the monitoring, it was one year out of three that has severe uh, drought. 
but we know that it's going to get worse around here in the south of France. So let's say it's going to be one year out of two and see how it's going to alter our population projection. If we consider that in average, one year out of two is going to be a bad year. So we use this frequency of bad years in the probability of picking each year the good or the bad uh, transition matrix. We run the projection. We can look at the first values uh, of, of the six first populations. Or we see that a lot of them are at zero at the last time step already. Up. So let's calculate the long run stochastic growth rate, which is below one. So the population in average is strongly declining here. So probably the probability of extinction is going to be very high. So here we set uh, 30 as a quasi-extinction threshold. You could change that. Oh, it's probability of extinction is one in many cases. So let's plot it, but it's probably really high. Yep. So you see after 10 years, if in average we have one bad year out of two, where reproduction, reproduction completely fail, the probability of extinction after 10 years is about 80%. And you calculate it. After 20 years is 0 0.09, 9.9. So <clears throat> what is interesting here is to play with these values and see how it uh, affects your projections. OK. Um, yeah, so you can play with the script and uh, and change the different values and see how it alters your conclusions. So uh, a few last uh, words, a bit more general about the PVA. Uh, we've seen here a few uh, interesting uh, use of the PVA to quantify the rate of population ch change over time estimate extinction risks that are used by the IUCN to set up some, uh, to list the species to assess their conservation status. It's very helpful to run sensitivity analysis to identify key parameters on which we should uh, focus or the, the, for the management actions. Um, yes, just said this. So, Yes, that's the main uh, interest of running PVA. Of course, um, well, sorry, you can do this. There are several useful packages here today. We use PubBio, but you can have a look at uh, Ramas. Especially this one is cool because uh, I just discovered uh, it recently. It went out in uh, 2022. You can include demographic stochasticity and specific management actions. So you can say this year, uh, 10 individuals who have, were removed from the population or we released uh, this number of adults or whatever. You can really uh, model the different management actions. There's the package pub demo and lefco 3 that are also useful for uh, matrix mod, uh, population matrix population models. So you can have a look at these different packages. Um, so we only uh, use the one sex models. So you can check, for example, at this paper from uh, Stéphanie Genouvrier in 2010, how to include the two sexes in a uh, matrix population model. There are other examples also in the literature. You can also, uh, in case of uh, working with species that are don't have a synchronous breeding, you can uh, have a look at this paper from Bakaya in 2009 with periodic matrix population models. There are also some papers about uh, continuous time modeling. It's possible. Um, some papers like uh, this one from Caswell and colleagues uh, with density dependent models. Uh, there are several ones also. In case you're working with species that have reached their recurring capacity or uh, you know that they are um, not in an exponential uh, growth or decline. We did not uh, 
uh, go through demographic stochasticity, but you can uh, include it in the model I, I just said using package uh, Ramos or coding it yourself. And in this case, you would uh, uh, at each time step generate a value for an individual, whether it survives or not, how many offspring it produced, etc. So then the simulations become a bit longer. But this is very important to include if you're working with small populations, because it can really uh, increase the probability of extinction. We considered no trend in the mean environmental condition or variance, but it's possible to include environmental covariates. If you, uh, for example, using capture capture models, you have uh, established a link between, I don't know, the temperature and survival rate, then you could use different matrices as a function of temperature, for example, and simulate the fate of the population using certain scenarios. Um, that's it. And uh, yes, but always remember when running PVAs that uh, we're making a lot of assumptions about the demographic parameters and also about the environment. So we are making the assumption that the environment about how the environment will be in the future. So if you're working with uh, data that are analyzed, collected on a on a long, on a short term, it's probably um, you're probably underestimating the the extinction risks of the population. Okay, know that uh, the longer uh, data series you have, the better the estimation of the temporal variance is going to be. So um, you get a better estimate of extinction risk if you work with longer data series. There was, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been several uh, papers that have uh, analyzed, compared the projections ma made using PVAs in the literature with what actually happened to the population. And uh, PVAs have been criticized, but uh, the, the, the main uh, things that came out of these papers is that if you use uh, a good data set uh, that you construct the, the matrix using robust parameters, it actually seemed to work pretty well in these cases, at least. Okay, so I provide some reference you can have a look to uh, if you want to know more about uh, the, the, the things you really should be careful about when running a PVAs and in which cases it, it works better than others. And uh, an important thing is really to pay attention to model construction, because um, uh, it seems that uh, further efforts may be required to educate biologists. So that was the, the, th th the paper recently came out by Kendall in 2019 that looked at the three most commonly common errors in the studies that published matrix population models. And uh, so that's uh, among the uh, compadre database that I showed you before. If you look at the, the matrix available for the species, it seems that 35% of published species fail to include uh, survival and fertility in the right row of the matrix. 62% introduced a one-year delay in age at first reproduction. 53% incorrectly estimate the asymptotic population growth rate because they use the wrong formula or the sensitive, or wrongly calculate the sensitivity. So it's very important to write the agenda of events, write the life cycle to make sure you correctly write your equations and the population matrix. So this paper was really interesting uh, for me and I show it to my student all the time. So um, in which cases constant deterministic models are useful? Uh, and PVS in general, when you have the a good knowledge about the species biology, so the life cycle is, uh, you know the life cycle well, and you have good estimates of the demographic parameters. And <clears throat> even if it's not always easy to have a good knowledge of what's going to happen in the future, sensitivity analysis are very interesting to identify the key demographic parameters and to evaluate the management actions. And 
it's uh, yeah deterministic models they are most useful for big populations because uh, the impact of demographic stochasticity is reduced for big population so it's very important to to include demographic stochasticity especially in in small populations there are also uh, species for which uh, survival and fertility are not really structured by age or stage and in this case uh, uh, it's better not to use matrix population models but other models that are more complicated um, for example uh, integral projection models for species for population for species that are structured by size for example um, and the other ones I mentioned already, that city dependent models, if it's useful, two sex models when uh, uh, there is skewed reproductive success. You have continuous time model, multi species models if, if you have several species that interact with each other. And the best model is not always the most complex, complex one, it really depends on the species and don't forget, it depends on the amount of data you have at hand. So in cases where you have few data, uh, deterministic model is going to be good enough to have an idea of the average trajectory, but running uh, models with environmental stochasticity, if we, you have very few data, you're going to have a bad estimate of the environmental variance, it might, it might not be very useful. So just yeah, keep that in mind. And that's a very a, a short list of reference. There are many, but these ones are really the, the main ones. So yeah, you can just read this paper. And I think Olivier is going to say a few words to conclude. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, a few slides to conclude the workshop. Uh, first, uh, uh, Sarah, Aurelia, and I would like to uh, thank the, uh, our helpers, Liz, Javi, uh, Thierry, Thibault, Valentin, Lo uh, Valentin and, and Marwan, who helped a lot uh, and answered uh, your, your questions. Uh, so we've seen how to uh, model population dynamics, how to estimate population size uh, with Aurelien, uh, abundance and density with counting method, detectability issue, uh, capture recapture, distance sampling, and emission models. Okay, so that's the output. And then we saw how to estimate the demographic parameters, open the black box and estimate uh, with capture recapture data survival and, uh, and transition probabilities. And uh, uh, today, we we learned how to uh, project population in the future and use a count-based uh, population viability analysis, agent stage, stage structured models, and sensitivity analysis. Okay, a few take-home messages and recommendations. Well, it's, it's all about models. So uh, a few, um, we thought that we would give a few uh, maybe uh, pieces of advice. So it's really up to you to use them or not. Huh? Um, the idea is to uh, first really think of your question and make it explicit. So make your ecological question explicit before uh, jumping into uh, the modeling uh, uh, stuff like uh, using R, uh, binding matrices and everything. Think of your model, maybe with a pen and paper or at least before jumping into R or in, uh, coding stuff. Think about it uh, uh, theoretically, formally. Start simple. That's true for any uh, any modeling exercise. Make sure everything runs smoothly, and then from there, you can add complexity one step at a time. Uh, it's it's pretty sure that it, uh, I mean it won't work if you start with a complex model. Uh, it's it's basic. Uh, uh, well, based on our experience. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's. Uh, the end of the workshop so till next time uh, probably uh, next year hopefully so the website uh, will be updated or actually it's already updated with the, the link to the video recordings so the video recordings for today we will up upload them uh, uh, to, uh, today well this evening and uh, and then they will be available uh, during the evening or tomorrow morning uh, at the latest and uh, it would be great if you could uh, give us some feedbacks on the on the workshop, the material, the way we uh, 
uh, we, uh, we deliver the, the lectures and the live demos. So um, everything is in this form here. It's a Google form. You just have to fill in a, a few uh, a few sections. It will to take you uh, two minutes. Um, that would be much appreciated. And last thing, uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, just uh, drop me an email and uh, we'll, uh, we'll send you that uh, with pleasure. And uh, yeah, we have this project uh, of a book on population dynamics uh, for 2024, 2025 with some colleagues of ours. And uh, yeah, and that's all. So I think we can call it a day. I hope uh, we hope that you uh, you enjoyed it and uh, that you find uh, uh, the workshop useful. I'm having a look to the yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, see you and um, happy uh, modeling. Bye. <laughs>